So hi everyone, I hope you can hear and see me okay. Okay, so you should see the website here. I've actually added um, on the first week, um, there's the video from last week, which Claire um, very kindly processed and put together. Uh, Claire pointed out last week that I, I hadn't been completely explicit about how to download, compile and run. So I've added a, an extra uh, slide to the talk which is updated since the lecture. I did talk about everything that you needed to do, but it wasn't ever on a particular slide. It was a mixture of slide and live. So, I'll sh so basically, um, I'll show what that extra slide is. The extra slide is just this slide here, compiling and running Hello World. Um, so, um, you'll see that on the on the on the DAC, which is the machine that some of you have got access uh, to by our, ourselves, which is a machine associated to the to the Archer service down for the data analytic cluster, you have to do a couple of um, funny module swaps. Um, that's specific to the DAC. It's happens to be because MPI is actually configured for the compute backend compute nodes that we're running on the login node. So this will change. They're not needed on most systems. If you're on your lap, and what you have to do to get MPI working will depend on what system you're on. However, on most systems you're on, um, it will just work. If you installed it on your laptop, it will be in the path. So this is just a slight quirk for the DAC. Then you can get the source code directly using wget, or someone pointed out last week that on a Mac, wget doesn't seem to be installed by default, but you can use curl, which is a equivalent thing. Then you can compile. Apologies, font is quite small, but I wanted to get things on a single line. Uh, MPICC minus O hello dot C if you're doing the C version. Then if you just MPI run minus N3 hello, we get three hello worlds. And out of the box, the program just printed hello world. The exercise last week, which I went over at the end, was to add a bit more um, MPI in there to actually say, look, hello, I'm rank zero, rank one, rank two in this example, and hello, there are three of us. Uh, other languages, Fortran use hello.f19 mpif 90 C++ use hello.cc and MPI CXX. I just use the C example as the, as the base one, so I'm kind of assuming that's what most people will be, will be doing. So what we're going to talk about first is point-to-point -point communications. But I actually wanted to sort of go through a bit of the, 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 the Pi example, um, just to illustrate a couple of points, which you may find, may be obvious to you, but but may not. So what I'll do is I will um, switch to um, sharing a screen. So I, what I've done is I have um, the example we're going to do, and, and I'll use it to motivate point-to-point -point communication is computing pi. And I, you'll see later in the course I've given up full solutions to, to this, including mesh passing. But let's look at the pi serial dot, dot C, which is serial solution to, 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 to the example. Pi serial dot C. So you can see this is just a simple serial program which summed up this series from and I've taken the value to be 840. So all it does is it says pi equals zero, then loops from i equals one, i less than equals n, i double plus. This is the thing that C programmers get wrong, they go from i equals no, i less than n, i double plus, but for the, for the, for the math to work out, i have to go from one to n. I just do this pi equals pi plus one over one plus i minus a half over n squared, and it looks a little bit contorted because uh, C is stupid, it doesn't understand maths, and also you have to do lots of casting. I'm fairly paranoid about casting. But this is just illustrating the, the, the equation which was in the slides. And then we have to normalize by 4 over n. And I compared the exact value, which if you um, um, arctan of 1 is pi by 4, so this is an easy way of doing it. So what we're going to do is we're going, if I compile that, I'll use the MPI compiler just for, for fun, but it's called pi serial, pi serial dot c and we run it, we get computing approximation to pi using any state 40, pi is equal to 1593, it's a reasonably good approximation. The error is, is one pi in a million accurate, that's fine. So, the important point is, this is a summation, i equals one to n. What we're going to do is we're going to split this up. So if we run on two processes, one, one rank zero would be due one to 420, rank one would be due 421 to 840. So what we're going to do, we're going to have to have a few variables. We're going to have to have int uh, size 
comma rank, and then we're going to have to initialize pi, uh, initialize pi, um, initialize MPI. Whoops, get the funny key. And then, and, and, uh, we have to finalize MPI at the end. We have to do the normal thing. The let's let let's let's find out who we are. Com world. Oops, you can see that I'm not very good at uh, editing. So I'm just so this is just all I've done is taken the same program and put it into my MPI. Let's recompile. Uh, okay, so I didn't. I forgot to include mpi.h. So that shows you that what does mpi.h define? It defines the function prototype, but also it, it defines magic constants like mpi com well. So that was a, if I do mpi run, and it's m3 dot slash pi, see that's now called. Okay, so what you've seen there is, um, all I've done is I've replicated the calculation. Hello from rank zero out of three, hello from rank one out of three, hello from rank two out of three. But every rank, every process is independently computed pi, which is not what we want. We want them to get together and then compute subsections. So how do we do that? Well, what some people do at this point is they do this. They say, okay, let, let's imagine I'm running on two processes. They do two things. They say, first of all, I'm gonna need um, I'm gonna need two values of pi. I'm going to need to have a pi value, let's say uh, double pi one, pi zero, sorry, and pi one. And then they say, okay, I'll split, I'll say if rank equals zero, do this. And then it's not formatting very well. If I do the same again, if rank equals one. So what they people do is they type, see if I can format this a bit better, so it's not it's a to format. Anyway, um, and they just say, well, for rank equals one, I left them equal to n over two. And if rank equals one, they do for i equals n over two plus one, I left them equal to n i double plus. And then let's say I've initialized pi zero and pi one. I do pi zero equals pi zero plus pi one equals pi one plus. And let's just print uh, but this is not, I'm trying to do this to illustrate and Uh, let's just do it here. And I'll do the same in here. Apologies for formatting. Okay, so let's compile that and we'll run it on two processors. So this code seems to work re reasonably well. So on rank zero, pi is, is the first half, 1.854, and on rank one, pi is that. And if you add them together, you would get, I think, in fact, I could just check. I'll add these together, 
1.4591 plus 1.287002 is 3.1. Oh, I've got that slightly wrong. Um, why have I got that wrong? Uh, let's see. Yeah, but I understand how I've managed to do get that wrong. But basically, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is the kind of code that some people write. And this is not the right thing to do for, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you've got replicated code here. We've got the same code here, okay? But also, um, it, this, this code is tied to two processes. This code only works if I have separate if branches, rank equals zero or if rank equals one. This code is completely tied to two processes. So, so I've written a parallel code. Now, what we're going to do at the end is how do I add these numbers together? What, what one rank has a partial sum, the other rank has a partial sum. They're going to add them together doing message passing. That's what we're going to cover in the next lecture. But I'm trying to illustrate what, when a lot of people do this example for the first time, this is the kind of code they write. And this code is, is, is wrong. Well, it works. In, in principle, but it, it's the wrong approach for two main reasons. A, as I said, it's explicitly tied to two processes, rank, zero, rank. But if I wanted to run it on three, I'd have to have another branch here. Clearly, if you're going to run this in a thousand processes, it's just not, not going to work. And second, you have replicated code. You've replicated the entire code here. This code and this code are almost exactly the same, except they add to different variables. And the third conceptual mistake which I've made here is that I said to myself, well, I need a pi zero for rank zero to accumulate its sum. I want a pi one for rank one to accumulate its sum. Well, that's not true because remember, the best conceptual model I think you have for running this program is that the program for rank zero is running on this laptop and the program for rank one is running on that laptop. If they both have a variable called pi, the variable this, just because it's the same name doesn't mean it's the same variable. This laptop has a variable called pi. This laptop has a variable called pi. They're different variables. They can just accumulate to their own local value of pi. You don't need to have a pi zero for this process and a pi one for this process. That may be completely obvious to you. I'm sorry if I'm laboring the point. But in the SPMD model, single program multiple data, when you run this program, when you have the statement double pi, that means that every process I, 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 yeah. Every process um, is going to have, I've got the on here, every process has a value of pi. So if I run on two, there are two pi, if I run on four, there are four pi. And so the right way to do this, and we'll talk about this later, but is really to take the original code, just leave it as it was. Go in the print. But the main thing is, the main point is to change this into having an I start and an I stop. So this is single program, multiple data. Each program, each process runs the same program, but they have different data. They have different values of I start and I stop. And all you do is you do I start is some, I'll come back to this later, some function of rank, the size, and n. And I stop is some function of rank, size, n. You just have to work them out. But then the loop is the same. So every process is actually using the same code, single program. They're all running the same program. Do they do the same thing? No, because you have multiple data. You have these variables, I start and I stop, where you have constructed to be dependent on the rank. Okay. So what this would be, I start would be rank times n over size plus one, and I stop would be I start plus n over size. But the point is, you, 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 the, the style which you should get used to in writing message passing programs is that you have a single piece of code, but if you want different processes to do different things, you typically mess around with loop limits and make them process dependent. You don't write in general, you don't write different branches of code for different processes. If you have some controller worker situation, you might have a controller function and a worker function. But normally in SPMD, every process is doing the same kind of thing. They're just working on different data. And here the different data is I may start and I stop. So that may seem to have been a bit slightly um, overblown, but it, it is important to realize that the style is to program um, in this way and not to have separate branches for each, for each process. However, if we were to run this program at this point here, 
Rank zero would have a value of pi, rank one would have a value of pi. We want to add them together. They're on different computers. How do we do that? We do message runs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a lecture which actually um, talks about uh, message passing, and then we will um, have a break. And the uh, the exercise is to uh, effectively take the, uh, the the pi example and um, start working on it and start putting message passing in. So start doing this kind of stuff on it, and then uh, add the numbers together. It, you won't be able to do it in one in one bash, um, but that's why both exercise uh, sessions this afternoon are based on calculus. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, if I have the lecture loaded up, um, is to give the actual le um, going to give the uh, lecture about messages. We've talked about messages a lot, but we've not really talked about what they are in detail. So, what are messages in MPI? Well, in MPI, a message it contains a number of elements of some particular data type. And the important point to make here is that in MPI, messages are fairly basic objects. Um, they are, a typical message in MPI would be five integers, six floating point numbers, 10 characters, okay? Or if you're a Fortran programmer, uh, 16 complex numbers. They're not objects, they're not, you can define your own data types, but fundamentally, if someone says they're sending a message to MPI, your model should be, okay, they're sending 10 integers. And this is because MPI was designed for scientific and technical programming, where we tend to have that kind of situation. Um, MPI has both basic data types, which will come back to our derived types. We're not gonna really cover derived types in this course, uh, but um, they are um, slightly more, um, um, complicated, but we'll talk about basic types. But you can build up derived types, can be built from basic types. And just to, give a slight bit of feedback, I don't know if someone maybe has their, um, their microphone on. Um, oh, okay, I'm not getting feedback actually. How was that? I was getting this furious squeaking from my fizzy water, apologies for that. Um, if you want to say, to, if, if you're going to say, well, wait a second, you're saying I can send integers, floating point numbers, but I'm a C programmer, fundamentally, I have lots of my basic object in my program is a structure containing a bunch of integers and a bunch of real numbers. You can build up structures in MPI, they're called derived types, and you can send and receive structures as well, but that's slightly beyond the scope of this, this introductory course. So, this will become a bit more obvious uh, when we um, when we do a specific example, but this is where you hit the point, the, hit the um, um, the ramifications of the fact that MPI is implemented as a library. And so, when you send data to MPI, please send this array. You have to tell MPI what the array is made of. And so, you you pass a, a little magic number, a little constant, which tells MPI. Um, what that data type is. This is one of the few places where MPI differs between C and Fortran, because C and Fortran have different basic types in the language. Every type in the language, there'll be a magic number in MPI which tells MPI what that, what that type is. And so, for example, if you want to send a character in C as a signed car, when you pass such an array to MPI, you'd say it was an array of type MPI. More useful, you might do integers, MPI int, or uh, floats or donalds. And in practice, most scientific and technical programs do nothing more than send ints, uh, floats, and doubles. There are lots and lots of types in C, um, but um, I've never decided, that, I've never defined an unsigned long int in my life, but anyway, there it is. Uh, Fortran has a more restricted set of types, but um, more um, designed for scientific and technical programming. If you do integers in Fortran, you just type MPI integer. Reels and double precision, MPI real, MPI double precision. Now, again, Fortran's MPI was defined back in the early 90s. Fortran 90 um, introduced a much more complicated, sophisticated type system. But basically, if you want to send four byte reels, you say MPI real. If you want to send eight byte reels, you say MPI double precision. Fortran's complexes and logicals. MPI character, a word to Fortran programmers, don't avoid sending characters around in Fortran. Uh, characters are slightly strange in Fortran. Uh, Fortran distinguishes between array, an array of six characters and a string 
which is six characters long. And if you don't understand that definition, that distinction, you get into lot, lots of problems in Fortran. So um, Fortran strings are a bit too complicated for their own good. So I, I would not send characters in Fortran. It can be a bit of a hassle. But for basic types, um, yeah, so Fortran doesn't like characters to begin with. That's correct. Um, so, um, so um, OK, but it'll be probably more, it'll be more obvious when we come to the explicit example how this works. So we're going to talk about point-to-point -point communication in the first place. You've got some data on one process. You want to send it to another process. How do you do that? Well, point-to-point -point communication is a communication between processes. Here I've got process zero talking to process two. Um, the source process sends the message to the destination process. And we'll see that in MPI, we've seen that the processes are identified by this unique rank, which whether in C or Fortran goes from 0 to N minus 1. So that's quite nice. The communication takes place within the communicator. Now, we're not going to discuss communicators much in this course again, but communicator defines a communications world. And, and a message is completely ring fenced within the communicator from which it was sent. Now, we're always going to use MPI COM world, which contains everybody. But in principle, you could have a communicator here another communicator here and a, a message sent within a communicator can only be received within that communicator if you're doing more sophisticated programs it allows you to effectively split your your parallel machine and software into two different worlds but we'll just the mpi com world which includes everybody the destination process is identified by its rank in the communicator so that's quite a nice thing the rank being between your and minus one so that's so some term this is very important terminology point to point messaging in mpi how does it work? Um, point to point messaging in MPI. So, how it works is that the sender calls a send routine, okay, specifying the data that is to be sent. So, as I said, as we mentioned in the, in the concept talk last week, message passing is two sided. You have an active sender and active receiver. So, the sender calls a send routine, specifying the data that is to be sent. And MPI calls this the send buffer. You might call it the send array or the send variable. The MPI calls it the send buffer. The data that is to be sent is called the send buffer. The receiver has to actively call a receive routine, specifying where the incoming data should be stored. This is called the receive buffer. So that, that, that illustrates the two fundamental concepts of MPI. A, the receiver has to actively receive, and B, it's the receiver who decides where to put the data. When I send data, I just say, here's some data, I want you to receive it. It's the receiver who decides when to receive it and also where to, where to put it. The receiver receives the data and puts it in the receive buffer. However, a message contains more than just the message data. A message contains header information, like where it came from, um, how long it is, and such like. And this is received in separate storage. So when you send a message, you just send the message, but, it, but MPI creates this header information for you. When you receive it, you have to separately receive the message and the metadata, and MPI calls it the status. So you may never look at it, and it's typically just, it's a fairly small piece of data, uh, but you, the sender specifies the send buffer, the receiver specifies the receive buffer for the data, and this status storage area for receiving the metadata, and we'll come back to that. So we talked about, um, again, last week, the communication even in everyday life, can be, can be synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous is like making a phone call, or I said sending a fax. Uh, asynchronous is like sending a letter or sending an email. Now, MPI allows you to send both synchronously or asynchronously. MPI has a mode, so the MPI calls these modes. Okay, whether, whether, whether an operation is synchronous or asynchronous, MPI calls them mode. So in synchronous mode, this only completes when the receive has completed. This is like making a phone call. So MPI allows you to say, I want to send this message synchronously. I want you to wait. Do not return control to me until the message has been received. You can also do asynchronous, which always completes unless an error occurs irrespective of a receiver. So an asynchronous send is like posting a letter or sending an email. Now, MPI calls that buffered send. Okay. Now, I'll come back to why it calls it buffered send later on, but synchronous send is synchronous, and an MPI buffered send is guaranteed to be asynchronous. Receive is always synchronous. It completes when a message has arrived. So in MPI, when you issue a receive, you say, I'd like to receive a message, and it's synchronous. You wait forever until a message comes in. We'll see later on how to get around the problems that might cause, but by default, receive is synchronous. 
Now, the confusion is the NPI has a mode called the standard send. And if you look at most NPI programs, they will use standard send. The problem with standard send is that it can be either synchronous or buffered. It can be either synchronous or asynchronous. So there are two slightly nasty things about NPI. The first nasty thing is that the, the initialization prototype for, for C, NPI init, has a silly prototype with lots of stars in it. But the most unfortunate thing about NPI is the standard send operation, which is the standard way NPI recommends you send messages. You do not know if it's synchronous or asynchronous. And I will come back to why that has been chosen as a, as a, um, as a design choice in NPI. There's a whole lecture about it after the coffee break today. But in this, in this course, generally when I say call NPI send, I want you to call synchronous send. The reason being you know what synchronous send does. Synchronous send is like making a phone call, it sends the message and it waits until the message is received before it returns control to you. And that's um, clean and easy to understand and we know what it does. So if you want to do standard send, you call MPI send. If you want to do synchronous send, you call MPI S send. And this is the routine I would recommend you use in this course for all the exercises because it means that you tend to write correct program. Buffered send, MPI B send is guaranteed to be asynchronous. We tend not to use it again. I'll explain a bit why in the next lecture. Receive is MPI receive. Okay. So for this course, I would recommend you, you program using MPI S send and MPI receive. I'll explain the subtleties of what MPI send and MPI B send do in, in the next lecture. So yeah, so Keith saying, so so I alluded, so MPI has another concept um, called um, um, so MPI has a concept of the mode, which is whether a send operation is synchronous or asynchronous. It also has a, con a, a, a concept which it calls the form. And the form is, does the subroutine, ret the function return to you immediately and stuff carries on in the background, or does it wait? And that's called, MPI calls that the form or blocking, non-blocking. And we'll cover that, um, the lecture in week three, after the break, we have a lecture on non blocking communication, which covers I send and I receive. So we'll be covering them later on, but it's important to understand in some detail, I think, what send and receive do before you learn about the non blocking form. But a real program um, will tend to use things like I send and I receive. So I hope that's clear. But for the moment, we'll, we'll ignore blocking, non blocking. We're just talking about the mode. So, how do you send a message? So, this is the prototype. In C, first of all, we have a single routine, MPI. So here's, this is the synchronous send, MPI synchronous send, MPI S send. So there's a single send routine. Doesn't matter if you've got arrays of integers, floating point numbers, doubles, characters, whatever, there's a single send routine. And it takes the buffer, which is the send buffer, which is what you want to send. It takes the count, which is how many items you want to send. So this could be array of integers, you might want to send 10 integers, in which case count would be 10. You specify the data type, which is one of these magic numbers I alluded to earlier on, uh, which might be something MPI int or MPI car. You specify the destination, which is where it's going. You set where it's going to, which is the rank of the destination process. You specify a tag. I'll come back to the tag later on. You specify a communicator, which is the communicator, communications world in which this communication is taking place. And for these simple exercises, we'll always use using MPI com world. So we can send to anybody because everybody's a member of MPI. Fortran, um, similar, again, Fortran's case insensitive, so I've written another case here, MPI S send, buff, count, data type, dest, tag, communicator. Now, the difference between the prototype in Fortran and C is that Fortran returns the error code not by the return value of a function, but by an extra argument. Now, the, the count, data type, you'll see here that these handles, the data type, the communicator, in C are of type MPI data type or of type MPI COP, so there'll be some kind of type def. In Fortran, again, the MPI interface for Fortran was specified a long time ago before Fortran 90 was invented. Fortran didn't have um, the equivalent of derived types in those days. And so all the params are just integers. Except for the buffer, the buffer, this is like a pseudo syntax. This is saying the buffer can be of any type. Fortran doesn't actually allow you to do that. It's illegal in Fortran to have a buffer of undefined type, but 
let's just hoodwink the compiler. This is just saying that the buffer can be of any type. This is like a pseudo syntax. This will become always a lot, a lot more clear when we do a specific example. So the only difference between the T and the Fortran prototypes are in C, the, the data, the, the any handles have specific data types in Fortran are just integers, and the Fortran routine takes an extra error code, which in C is the return type function. Let's do a specific example then. So we want to send data from rank one to rank three. So we define an array of 10 integers. I'll do a Fortran example afterwards, but I'll do C first. So we just derive, define an array of 10, int x 10. I want to send x to, um, excuse me, I want to send the array x to rank three. So I say I've got x and it's got 10 integers. So I'm telling the MPI that it's got 10 inches. I need to tell it what the type is because languages like C and Fortran don't dynamically pass type information. So if you call a C function, you have to tell it that this is made of integers. I want to send it to rank three. So I say source equals three. Uh, that's wrong. Apologies. That is dest. I'm sorry about that. That is a typo which I fixed but didn't clearly. Apologies for that, I will fix that. Um, so it's actually dest, uh, I've kind of screwed that up, but I'll try and fix that. I'm just trying to be difficult to see what I'm editing here, but this will be. Apologies for that. Well, that's the destination. Uh, and that's the tag. I'll come back to what the tag is. I'll fix these slides afterwards. Apologies for that. That's the destination. I'll come back to what the tag is later on. So, I want, if I can just get close enough to that, I'm annoyed that I made that mistake, so apologies. Okay, I understand why it's not. It's not letting me change it because it's been grouped up into a, into a, a bigger object. So apologies for that. But that, that is the destination and that is the tag. So I want to send an array of 10 integers um, to rank three from rank one. That is not what this code will do. As Richard, I want rank one to send a message to rank three. That is not what that code does. What does that code actually do? If I was to compile and run that code, can anyone tell me what it would do? Anyone got a guess? I want rank one to send data to rank three. That's not actually what that code does. If I compile and run that code as it looks like, it wouldn't, that isn't actually what it would do. What would happen? The question is who would send data to rank three here? So remember, MPI's SPMD, single program multiple data, this program is run by everybody, okay? Or exactly, so that's exactly right. What would happen here is if, 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 um, if run as written here, all ranks would it execute a send, a synchronous send to rank three. And that has two, um, uh, well, it basically means that this program is guaranteed to deadlock, okay? First of all, if every ascending, hopefully down here, someone else would be calling a receive. Because this is synchronous send, everybody is phoning, okay? Everybody is phoning rank three. I'm wondering why rank three, uh, so, so, so and in particular, rank three is phoning itself. I'm wondering why the phone is engaged. So the important point though is everybody is doing a synchronous send. So everybody is saying, I will not, this synchronous send will not complete until somebody answers, somebody posts a receive. But no one's going to post a receive because everyone's calling synchronous send. And also, as I said, rank three is, is phoning to itself. I'm wondering, as I said, why the phone is engaged. And so if you want to do what this, um, what this slide said, you want to send data from rank one to rank three, you need to say, if rank equals one, then send. Now this, now this does what uh, we're expecting. So because of the SPMD nature of MPI, where everything is executing everything, if you want stuff to be executed by a single process, you put if statements in. And the classic time you do that's for print statements. You don't want 100 print statements saying hello, you say if rank equals zero, hello. Okay. In Fortran, uh, in C, if I wanted to send a scalar, it would be exactly the same, int x, if rank equals one, but the C prototype would expect a pointer, so I have to take the address of x and say it's one integer. 
Okay, so um, that's a slight. If you want to send the scale, I use the same routine. But you pass a pointer. If you get it wrong, the, it will complain because it'll say the prototype isn't correct. Fortran is almost exactly the same. I've just except um, I've made the same mistake here with with, with dest here. Uh, the reason I made the mistake is I used to indicate what source and dest were by different colours, and that didn't come out particularly well. So I changed it to these um to these little uh, these little uh, flags, but I, I've messed them up. So apologies about that. Um, that is not the source, that is the destination. So in, in Fortran, I have an into dimension 10x, I have an array of 10 integers. I say if rank equals one, I call MPIS, and it's exactly the same function, except I have an error variable on the end, which is, a, which is, a, which is a, um, an integer. But I say x is 10, and in Fortran, I say MPI integer, just to match with the, with the definition here. Um, the scalars in, in, in MPI, in Fortran, um, uh, you don't, Fortran always passes by reference, so you don't have to differentiate between an array and a scalar, um, unless you're a Fortran purist, an array is effectively, a, a scalar is effectively an array of length one. Um, you do call MPIs an x1 integer, so that's the only difference. If you're sending an integer scalar, you don't have to worry about taking pointers and stuff like that. So, was that clear? As I said, a lot of people um, kind of skip over send, but it isn't, it isn't completely trivial, um, and I haven't explained what tag is, but I'll come back to that yet. So if anyone has any questions, please ask them now, but if not, I'll carry on and talk about receive. So receive is quite similar to send. You call, a, you call an MPI receive, you give a buffer and a count and a data type, and that's for the incoming data, okay? Where do you want the data to go? It goes in the receive buffer. You say who you're receiving from, which is the source. You specify a tag, which I'll come back to, and you specify a communicator, and you specify status. So as I said, the receive has two storage areas. The buffer, which is for the data, which is a current data type, might be 10 integers here. But the status is where, the, where you get the metadata. This is where the, the envelope information comes in. So you have to um, So send, receive, I'll come back to send, receive. Um, Send receive. I'll, I talk about when I um, uh, when I talk about non-blocking communications. So th there is a, there is a combined routine called send receive, uh, but I will I will cover what that does um, um, in the um, in the in the lecture next week. In four times MPI receive buff count data type source time com status. There's two differences. First of all, uh, there's the error variables before, but again, in Fortran, at least in the, the Fortran 90 version of MPI, again, these, these handles, the status is not, an, is not a type, it is just a little, a little array. So basically, what status is in C, a status little structure that remembers lots of stuff like where the message came from, how long it was, and other bits and pieces in a little structure. Again, MPI was defined a long time ago before Fortran, before Fortran had its derived types of its version of structures. And so in MPI, at least in the standard version, uh, the state is a little integer array of size MPI status size. So it's a little array. It's slightly awkward, but that's the way it is. Again, it'll become more easy when we do a specific example. If I want to receive data from rank one on rank three, I say um, I do a receive. Now that is the source and that is the tag and again I want to receive data from rank one on rank three if I only want one person to do the receive I have to say if rank equals three so remember rank one sent to rank three so rank three has to receive from rank one so I want to receive MPI receive y this is my where the data wants to go ten integers I want to receive from um, from source one the tag is extra information you can put on a message so it's a bit like when I when I um, get a, a letter through the door, at least in the old days, um, a normal letter would be in a white envelope and a bill would be in a red envelope. Tag is extra information you can attach to the message. So you don't have to use it, but at the send side, I'm saying when I'm sending MPIS send, I'm sending this message is of type tag zero. Okay, I've just decided this is this is like saying it's it's white, it's colored white. I can associate a, a Small amount of metadata chosen by the user with the message, and it's called the tag. So when I receive, I have to say what that tag is. So I want to receive 
from rank one, tag is zero within MPI Com world. The data goes into the Y array and the metadata goes into the status variable. Again, if I wanted to do a scalar, it's exactly the same, but I'd have to receive into a pointer, a pointer to Y, which is one integer. So the things which um, which may not be obvious is that, that um, this, I'll come back to this, but this tag is a requirement. You were saying, I want to receive a message from source one, and it must be of tag zero, okay? So if the incoming message is not from source one or not of tag zero, it won't match, okay? And you will just wait for another message to come in. You might wait forever and we'll come back to that. But this tag, the, the, uh, the tags that source and receiver, send and receiver have to match. Um, the other thing, the other um, thing which isn't obvious at all, is what this ten means here. Okay, so someone can maybe take a guess, and this is—it's not obvious at all. So you know, I don't expect people to get this right. It's not obvious. But what do people think um, that ten means? And say so NPI receive Y ten integers from source one. What does this ten mean? Not valid expected. Okay, so so this is so you would basically you would think exactly what Ben said here that it's the number of elements expected. It is actually not the number of elements expected. What it is is it is the size that you have reserved for that message. So what you're actually saying now, in, in some cases, it can be the number of elements you expect. But formally, what you're saying is, I want to receive a message from what from rank one. I'm going to store it in the array Y. And by the way, I have reserved enough space to store 10 integers. Okay? That may not be the, the length of the incoming message. Okay? Um, so I'll come back to that. Now, again, in this simple example, we knew we'd send 10 inches, we will we'll receive 10 inches. But formally, you're just saying, I want to receive a message from, from, from rank one, and I have reserved enough space for 10 integers. We'll come back to what happens if, if, if that isn't true, if, if they don't match up. Um, receive data from rank one on rank three and four times, just the same, interdimension 10, Y. The only difference is in C, the status was, I'll go back to that, in C, the status was the little structure of type MPI status. In Fortran, at least in the Fortran 90 interface, it's an array of size, MPI status size. MPI status size is a little, is a number 10 or something implementation dependent, but it's, it's a small array. And again, in Fortran, you don't care if you're receiving arrays or, or scalars, it's the same, the same number. You just say what to receive one integer. So in synchronous blocking message passing, um, the process is synchronized. The sender process specified the synchronous mode, that was MPIS send, and it's blocking. Both processes wait until the transaction is completed. And we'll see, we'll see that if, 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 if um, if the sender issues a send and there isn't a receive, the sender will wait forever. If the receiver issues a receive and there isn't a matching send, the receiver will wait forever. So it's very easy to make to write programs which deadlock and just don't work. You have to match up the sends and receives. For communication to succeed, the sender must specify a valid destination rank. The receiver must specify a valid source rank. The communicator must be the same. As I said, then messages are ring to within the communicator of which they were sent, so that the, the, the source and um, the, death, the sending and receiving communicator must be the same. As I keep saying, that's not be an issue in this course because we're using MPI com well. The tags must match. And so, so when you say I want to receive a message of tag zero, that is a requirement. You're saying I'm only going to receive a message of tag zero. It's like me waiting at the door and saying, look, I'm gonna, I want to receive a red message, a red letter. I'm not going to read white letters. The message types must match. The receiver's buffer must be large enough. Okay, so the big question here is what happens if the receiver's buffer is what happens if the incoming message is too large or too small? Okay, so it turns out in MPI that if the sending message is too large, then MPI will crash. Well, MPI will report an error. So if if you say I want to receive a message and I reserve ten inches for it, the incoming message is twenty inches long. NPI will, will, will crash and give you some error messages saying in, incoming message too large. However, 
if the if the message which is coming in is, is smaller than is equal to or smaller than the receive buffer side the messages will match and it will come in the question then is well i received the message how do i know how long it was and that all that information is stored in the status so um the other part thing you might think is well it's a bit weird to have a tag okay i, I specify the send message with, with with, with a specific tag, I, I might want to use that, that that tag to communicate extra information. Like, is it is it a red letter or a white letter? Is it tag zero or one? But to receive that message, you have to specify an explicit tag. So you can only receive the message if you knew what the tag was it was sent with. So that seems to be a bit of a bit of a pointless thing to do. Well, the important point is MPI can wildcard. So you can wildcard. You can receive from any source with MPI any source. You can say, look. I want to receive a message, but not from a particular source. I want to receive a message from anybody. You can also wildcard on the tag. You can say, look, I want to receive a message, but I don't care what tag it is. I want to receive a message of any tag. Then the obvious question is, well, I received a message. Where did it come from? What tag was it? And so that's, that all that information is stored in the status parameter. So you often use the status parameter when you're wildcarding. You say, I want to receive a message from anybody. You get the message, clearly you want to know where it came from, you have to examine the status object. And so the, the status it includes the kind of metadata, which is not just the, um, the, the data, but the kind of header and envelope information you might put on a physical web. So the envelope information is returned in the status, and you can, um, you can query in C, it's quite nice, the source and the tag are specific um, uh, components in the structure. So, so in C, this object, the status, which is the type MPI status, that's a little structure, and status.mpi source is the source where, where the message came from. Status.mpi tag is the tag uh, of the incoming message. Again, you tend to only use those if you've wildcarded, because if you didn't wildcard, you know that the receive wouldn't have matched unless the sources match and the tags match. But if you wildcard, you may have to look them up at one time. Uh, the count is the other thing you might want to know. You might want to say, OK, I issued a receive. My receive buffer was 10 integers long. A message came in. How long was the incoming message? For technical reasons, that isn't stored in the status directly. You have to pass the status to, to help a function called MPI get count. It's slightly complicated, but you can imagine that maybe MPI knows that the incoming message was 40 bytes long. That could have been the 10 integers or five double precision numbers. So it turns out MPI is not a well-formed question in MPI to ask how big was the incoming message. You have to ask how big was the incoming message in terms of integers, how big was the incoming message in terms of doubles. And that requires a little helper function called MPI get count. So you have to pass the status variable to MPI get count and say, OK, this is my status variable. And you might say, you might call MPI get count with status and say MPI integer, and MPI would return with you how many, how, how long the message was in terms of integers. So it's slightly awkward, but um, you have to pass the status to help a function to get the length of the incoming message. Um, so that's, that's a bit unfortunate, but that's the way it works. So um, message order preservation. Um, now, I have, there's quite a bit of, whoops. Um, it's a bit difficult to explain message order preservation without um, um, going through in some detail. So I'll postpone that and, and I need a bit, a few more props maybe to, to cover how that works. But um, messages don't overtake each other in MPI. Now, for synchronous messages, that's a meaningless statement. Because synchronous, sending a, a message synchronously is like making a phone call. So if you phone somebody and they answer, you put down, you phone somebody, they answer again. At the sender side, you, um, you can't have more than one phone call on going at once, OK? So, so whether the messages are received in order is, is not, a, not a relevant question. However, it is a relevant question for asynchronous sends. So if you, if you post a letter or send an email, there is no guarantee when you post a letter or, or send an email that they will be received in order, OK? If I send you, if I'm on holiday, and I send you two postcards, you could receive them in, the, in a different order. MPI is not like that. Even for asynchronous messages, 
NPI guarantees message order preservation. If you send two messages in a certain order, they will be received in a certain order. And if you think about it, that kind of has to be true because if you're sending someone messages and then you send a final message saying, which indicates that's everything over, if the that's everything's over message overtook one of the data messages, the program would stop working. So NPI actually um, preserves message order. I'll go through that a bit, a bit more detail at, at the next lecture just to go through it. But it's not completely trivial to do. I actually asked this for something. So, but imagine that I'm in America and I'm sending postcards to my mother and I want her to, re to read the postcards in the order they were sent. How can I arrange that? How can I make sure that when my mother reads a postcard, she only reads it if it's, if it's, if it's in order? So that if they come out of order, she reads them in the correct, and she postpones reading one and reads the other one in, in, in the right order. What do I need to do uh, if I'm sending postcards to make sure that, that someone can read them in order? You know, if you've done networking, you might know the answer. I haven't, so it wasn't obvious to me. Anyone think of any way of making sure on when you're on holiday that people read your postcards in the order? Yeah, give them a number. Ah, so, so these are the two things people, people say date them or give them. So, they, so the first thing you might say is, and as I, I, my original solution to this was to date the postcards. That doesn't help though. I send the postcard, my mother gets it it's sent in January. I send the next postcard, my mother gets it it's sent in February. She doesn't know if I send the postcard between January and February. So, so dating them doesn't help them. Giving them a unique number helps. So what you have to do is when you send the, the, the first postcard here is special, you have to write on it, this is the first postcard. But if you number the first postcard one and the second postcard two, my mother gets a, a postcard labeled number in January. She gets a postcard labeled number nine in February. She won't read it because she said, well, the last one I got was seven. The next one has to be eight, so I won't read that. So by having a, a, a uniformly incrementing counter, you can, you, can, um, you can arrange for the receiver to receive the messages in order even if they're not, um, if they're, even if they're not, the order is not preserved on the network. And um, just like the mail delivery system, modern networks don't actually, at a fundamental level, preserve uh, message ordering. Different packets are messages split to packets, and the network will take different routes. If there's congestion, it will reroute packets. So if the first packet, you can send two packets. Like this first packet gets stuck in some congestion, the second packet goes, oh, there's a traffic jam, it will go some other way and probably arrive uh, beforehand. So there's a lot of technology and networks to cope with this. But you, you can see that it is quite simple to do if you have it. You don't have to worry about this, it's just, it's just a thought exercise, but MPI remembers the order that they were sent, and so messages are received in order. It's slightly more subtle now, which I'll talk about next, but you don't have to worry about message order preservation in MPI, they are received in order. In all the message passing systems, that wasn't guaranteed, and so you often use the tag. You have to tag things with this uniformly incrementing number to make sure that message order was provided. MPI is a lot more sophisticated than that. So um, the, I'll skip over the message order preservation um, slide and, and talk about them later. I need a few props. But the exercise we're going to do is really to calculate pi. So um, what we're going to do is, it's, it's exercise two on the exercise sheet. Remember, the exercise sheet is, is linked in. Um, I will remind you later on, but the exercise is linked in right at the top from the week one, uh, in the week one timetable. I'll remind you where that is in a second. But uh, on the exercise sheet, it, th th this exercise illustrates two things. A, how to illustrate how to divide the work based on the right. And I already indicated that a bit when I did the somewhat error-prone coding on the board at the start, you basically have to say, if I'm, the idea, the simple way to do it is imagine you run on, on four ranks, so size equals four. You say, okay, size is equal to four, N is 840, so I have to divide 840 by four. That means we're all doing a chunk of 210. So you know that your chunk of work is 210 long. Are you doing the first chunk, the second chunk, the third chunk, or the fourth chunk? That's based on your rank. So if you're, if you're rank zero, you do the first chunks, you go from one to 240. If you're rank one, you do the second chunk, which is 241, sorry, one to, one to 210. If you're the second chunk, you do 211 to 120, all the way up. And so you can just do a bit of multiplication and division to do that. 
And I said the best way to do that is to parameterize your loop as having an I start and an I stop, and you mess around with those vet variables depending on, on the values of rank and size. You don't write separate code blocks for each rank because that, although that may work, it's not a, um, a scalable, a sustainable way of programming. Um, N is not the, some people think that N is the number of processes, it's not. You should try to write a program which could say N is 100 running on four processes. So each process doesn't just add up one term in the series, it adds up a whole chunk of them. Of course, you should be able to run any number of processors. You, sh you, can, uh, you can assume that, that, that N is divisible by the number of processes. That's why I picked 840. It's divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, number 8, and 9, probably 10. Divisible by everything up to, not up to 11. Um, but the important point is um, the, the solution I outlined at the start. We ended up with a situation where each process, each rank, had its own value of pi, but you want to accumulate them. So what you want to do is to nominate a, 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 a boss processor, um, a coordinator, uh, and that will normally rank zero. So what I would do is you will have that all the processes except rank zero will send their data to rank zero, and rank zero has to receive the data from the other processes. So you want n minus one of the processes, say rank one to rank n minus one to do a send, and I would recommend doing synchronous send, um, because it means it's um, the program is more uh, predictable. You know what it's going to do. We know what synchronous send is. It's like making a phone call, and the and, and the um, the uh, coordinator, the boss process, for rank zero, or who receives and adds them together. So I'll go through this exercise in some gory detail um, at the beginning of, of of next week. But the next half hour is just a chance for you to start programming them up and running it. The first thing is to get the calculation up. So the, the, the first checkpoint, so if I go to the exercise sheet, this is a good chance to do it. I will. Um, okay. Uh, I want, if you're really sophisticated, I, I want you to time your program. This may be quite difficult to do because some of you will be running on shared systems, but at least for a small number of processes, it may make sense. If you want to time a program um, in, 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 four, in C, there is a, an MPI time, an MPI time, and in four times, MPIW time. It's called MPIW time, stands for MPI wall clock time. And that returns the elapsed time in, in, in as a double precision number in seconds. So there's a bit of up, and I will basically show you the exercise sheet to illustrate how to do that. So if I um, go to Working. Ah, it's a bit slow. Uh, this is the uh, web page. As I said, first of all, right, the exercise sheet is here under week one. I click on that. Make it a bit bigger. We're going to do this exercise here. Assuming you've done the hello world. Just, just, again, in all these things, just carry on from where you left off. So if you haven't done the hello world, just pick up and do that. But this is the parallel calculation of pi. The first thing to do is to arrange for a different process, do the computation for different ranges of i. And you can print the partial sums to the screen and check the values are correct by adding them up by hand. I, I somehow they got it wrong before. But then the next thing is you want them to you want your, your computer program to add them up. Now we want to accumulate these partial sums by sending to the master rank zero. All processes except the master send their partial sums to the master. The master receives the values from the other processes and adds them to its own partial sum using MPIS send and MPI receive. There's some extensions here, but there's a little thing here about timing MPI programs. Um, what you do in MPI is you take a start time and you take a stop time and you subtract them. We haven't covered barriers yet, but it's slightly subtle that when you want, if you're timing a program, you want everyone to start at the same time. And so you want everyone to line up the starting line at the same time. So when you're timing, timing can be quite subtle in parallel programs because different processes can take different amounts of time. The simplest thing to do is to line them all up at the start line. And we call a barrier here. We'll come back to do how to do that next week. But MPI barriers says, look, all line up at the starting line, fire the gun, and then wait for everyone to finish and stop. So you get the maximum time. This is a simple prescription for measuring time. As I said, what time means in parallel programs can be a bit confusing because each process makes it, has its own runs independently. But this, 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 this makes sure they all start at the same time, we wait for them all to finish, and we, we measure the time in that way. 
And if you do this all time, all processes will record almost exactly the time. Timing is slightly subtle um, performance, but the most important point about this exercise to get it working functionally, make sure you can calculate pi in parallel and um, and use and it illustrates send and receive. So um, there's really from now until um, three, the idea was it's a practical session, people will work on the exercise, I'll be here to answer questions. Then if I go back to the timetable, um, I will come back after the break, I'll take a break from three to half three, and then um, at half three, I'll talk about communicators, tags, and modes, which goes through, um, tries to explain, the most important point of, the, of this lecture is trying to explain uh, why does MPI take this apparently slightly strange decision that when you call MPI send, you don't know if it's synchronous or asynchronous. You don't like to know if it's going to be like making a phone call or sending a letter. Um, to avoid that ambiguity, you should use MPI S send. You should call the explicit synchronous send version, which means we know what's going on. But I will explain uh, the rationale behind that there. Um, and there is a Pi solution which I've stuck up. Um, you can download that if you want, but I, I recommend you have a bash at the exam. I'll be around um, online if you have any questions in the next half hour. Please post them either via the audio or via the chat. But the idea is now between now and three, you're working on the exercise, break to half three, and I'll come back and lecture at half three again. But please, if there are any questions about, um, so uh, people often in, in um, these courses just rush through send and receive. Send and receive aren't as simple as they might initially um, uh, appear. There are these issues about the sender just specifying a send buffer, the receiver specifying um, both the receive buffer for the data and the separate storage area of the metadata, which is called the status. There are issues about when when messages match up, what happens if there's, if there's a send and no receive, or receive and no send. And the thing which people most get wrong is that the, the, um, the receive count is the size of the buffer that you have reserved for the message coming in, is not necessarily the size of the incoming message. In simple programs it will be, but in general it isn't. So if anyone has any questions, please post them up, or while you're doing the exercise, please um, uh, use the chat to, to, to answer questions, and, and we should be able to uh, do screen sharing if you want, um, if you're having problems with the mechanics of compiling or getting any kind of errors. So again, I will start lecturing again at half past three, and I'll be here online till three to answer any questions. So, um, sorry, she's asked a very, a very uh, uh, good question. Is it safe to put our data in MPIS and or to have to find a temporary variable? So, I'll come back to this um, in the next lecture, but for MPIS, it is safe to put the data in MPIS because um, when the you give the data to MPIS send, when MPIS send returns, you know that that data has been received because it's synchronous send. So when you call synchronous send, you know when the, when the routine returns that that data has been delivered. And so it's, it's perfectly safe to, um, to, 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 um, to just specify the data. You don't have to have a temporary variable because you know on return that it's already been, it's already been delivered so you can, then, you can then do with it what you want. I don't know if that's why you asked. I will cover this actually in the next lecture. Again, it's, it's, that's a very, it's not, that's a very good question. Um, you might ask, for asynchronous send, do I need to use a temporary variable? Because when, when the routine returns, I don't know if it's been delivered or not, but I'll come back to how that's implemented. But for synchronous send, it actually turns out always to be safe. It's always safe in MPI to specify the, um, I mean, that, um, the block from standard calls, it, it's always safe and the norm to, to put the data straight to the, to the routines. Um, and I'll explain why that is safe, even for asynchronous send in the next lecture. Does that answer your question? Again, as a design issue, uh, MPI is, it's a, not a design goal, but one of the things that MPI tries to do is to try and mean, try, try and prevent the user from having to do manual copying. There's a lot of features in MPI, 
which won't cover them like derived data types, stuff like that. Basically, an MPI is designed so that you, you don't have to do a lot of copying. Um, you can basically, you don't have to worry about that. You, you can just deal with the data that you have. Um, and that there are quite a few places in MPI where that is, uh, where there are ways to, that, that means the user tends not to have to do explicit copying of data into temporary buffers. You can just work with the data. So that's, that's a good question, thanks. Okay, so uh, John's asked a question. So this is this is um, this is a standard problem in C. So um, what? Okay, so what's happening here? So the question is, um, uh, John, uh, John's saying I had a problem with the first exercise. When when you you call com rank and you 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 pass a pointer to an address, you, you do int rank and you pass the address of rank. Uh, to uh, MPI com size, it worked. But if you declare a pointer and pass that, then it doesn't. So actually, what I'll do is I'll just um, this is only an issue for C programmers. So okay. Okay. So I'll actually switch to. Um, Another window because that's a that's a very good question. So I um I sometimes go over that in the lecture, but um, I didn't quite have time to do that. So it's what I'll just share content. So this is really just a question about C. So let's have a look. Let's, we've got the hello dot C here, and then we we'll want to do int rank MPI com com blank MPI com world okay. so that's that's just a the hello world program to compile it. Uh, oh, I can't type. Okay. I run my n3 dot slash hello. Hello from my oh, so I can mess that up. I didn't put a I didn't put rank in for that. Run it again. Hello from rank zero, hello from rank one, hello from rank two. So what this is saying is I've declared an integer. Just for because C passes by uh, by um, value, not by reference. If I want to alter, if I ever want to alter a variable in C within a function, I have to pass the pointer to it. I have to tell MPI, look, this is just taking the address of rank. This is saying where in memory is rank. Okay, this is functionally this passes the process. So if I did this, okay, MPI would complain because. It would say passing argument to of MPI com right makes pointer from integer without the cast. What that's saying is this argument is supposed to be a pointer to an integer and you've passed an integer. So let's just make that pointer. Okay. That will now compile. Hopefully. If MPI run it, I get I, I get a, a, a crash. And the reason is this is saying, I'm saying I've got a pointer to an integer, okay? But so that's a memory address, but I haven't actually allocated that memory. So I'm telling MPI to put the value of rank into a random memory address somewhere in memory, and, and that's just going to get um, um, uh, going to get um, go in a random place. In fact, if I print rank, there's um, percent p. Okay. Yeah. So by default, that that the value of rank pointer is nil. Is it is, is is the null address. An address zero is is is, is actually a legal address in, in C. So what you're saying is here, 
you're telling MPI, please give me the value of rank. It's like here. Please give the value of rank, which is MPI called rank, and stick it in the memory location pointed to here, okay? But that's pointing to a random memory location, and here it's actually null, which is zero, and, that's, and it, it's not allowing you to write that there. So does that make sense? So, so what you're supposed to do is declare the variable and tell MPI where it lives, well, with getting the pointer to it. If you just declare the pointer, it points somewhere random, and you get, and you get, um, and you get a crash at runtime. Of course, you can explicitly allocate memory. So the problem here is that this is a pointer to memory that's not been allocated. I could explicitly allocate it. I could say rank equals in star oops, malloc size of int. This is saying allocate me some memory which is big enough to, to, to store an integer and, and assign that to rank. So if I do this again. Right now has a, a, ver a, a value, some memory address, and it's oh, and I uh, and I have to do star rank. Okay, that's why I have to. So now I have to. So, so basically now I've defined rank. As, I should have called it rank pointer. Oh, I print it after the address of it. So, so I'm saying this points to an integer, but I don't know where it is. This said make it point to something that's been allocated. If I print it, it will have a sensible value. And then I actually here I have to I have to take the value of it. I have to dereference it. So what is the context of that? Um, sorry, now yeah, that'll work. So it is really just C. So it's the, the prototype says, I want to point it to an integer. Tell, give me a memory address where to stick this value. Um, that has to have a valid value. And the easiest way, so don't, this is, don't do this. I would just, you know, don't do all this stuff. Just do int rank. Pass the address of rank. It's much by far the easiest way of doing it. So that so does that I don't know if that helps. It's it's just it's just C um, um, the way that C does. Uh. Oh no, so it it int declares an integer, int star declares the address of an integer. And so say this is where an integer lives. So no, they're not on the same it, it an int star is a pointer to an integer. I mean, I don't know if I'm old fashioned, so I call it a memory address. You can call it a reference. But 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 int star says this is the address in memory where an integer lives. Okay. So um, the point in C is if you want if you want to alter a variable, you you want to alter the value of so so, so MPI com rank, we want we want MPI to alter the value of our rank variable. You can't do that in C by passing by passing variables because you, because the fu the function gets a copy of that variable. So if you just pass rank, it's not passed back to the parent thing because C always passes by, by, by value. It takes a copy. But what you do is you say you pass the address. You say I've got this variable, this 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 integer. It's a memory address eight seven five two. You say please change the value of the variable which is at, which is at location eight seven five two, and then it can twiddle with that value. So it's passing by reference, passing by value, which in my old fashioned mind is just passing a memory address. That's the only way in C you can you can allow a variable to be changed downstairs. Um, um, Fortran is different. Fortran um, in Fortran you always pass by reference in some sense. So in Fortran there isn't this distinction. Um, so in the Fortran one, um, I would just be able to do integer rank. Yeah, so when you declare it in star, it, it well, no, it 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 says that this variable is going to contain an address, but unfortunately, you have to tell it what the what the address what the address is. 
The other way, I don't know if it's obvious, the other thing I could do, um, maybe it makes it clearer. It, it, this is a C thing, obviously, not an MPI thing. This is just how C works. But if I do hello.c, what I could do is I could have said six star rank pointer. And I could say rank pointer is the address of rank. But all this is says is I've got a variable rank, an integer. I've got a variable rank pointer, which is going to hold a memory address, but initially I have an undefined value. I'm saying the address, this is saying set rank pointer to be the memory address of rank. So though I pass rank pointer here, this will actually this will actually change the value of rank because rank pointer is the address of rank. I don't know if that makes it clearer. Um, this should work. It works. It's just C. Um, yeah, we wouldn't design a language like this nowadays, but well, maybe do, but I don't know if that makes it clear. Um, it, yeah, that's it. Fine. So it is. It is the difference between um, passing by reference and passing by memory. So the most common, one of the most common mistakes in MPI is to do something like um, now the, the, the the one which people do often get wrong is they do they do uh, MPI com star status. MPI MPI status, status, and then they do MPI S send of wibble wibble, and then they do status. That is not going to work because it's good. MPI is going to try and scribble into the status, which doesn't point anywhere. What you should do, but this will pass the compiler. Passes the syntactical check, but it's not correct. You have to do MPI status status, or pass the address of status. So both of those, unfortunately, will pass the compiler. I don't if you're lucky, a clever compiler might might warn you. I don't know, but anyway, that's what you have to do. So actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because the the, the place where people most make most mostly make the mistake is when the states you have to declare the status variable, but for it to be altered by the the function you have to pass a pointer to it effectively say where it where it lives in memory. Yes, it is just that is just the way that C works. While I'm on, because this is really for the benefit of the video, uh, when I Try to do my. This is how you shouldn't do the pi example. It appeared that um, the they didn't. Um, I didn't get the right answer. I think it was just that I had actually. Um, I think it's just that I had messed up my addition. Uh, probably if I look back in the video. So this was my pi serial dot c where I did the thing I said you shouldn't do. What I did here is I basically had separate code for rank zero and rank one. This is this will work. Right, so if I rank equals zero, add up pi zero from one to n over two. If I rank one, add up pi one from n over two plus one to n. This code, as I said before, isn't scalable because you have to have a separate if branch for each rank. And also you've hard coded in here what the values are. And also you've, you've replicated this code loads at the time. So it's not, not a scalable way, but this program does actually work. I don't know why, I think I just, if I do MPICC minus O, Pi serial, pi serial. Dot C. I said when I did it before, these didn't add up. I think I was just being stupid. Um, I think if I add these up, if I cut and paste them rather than um, add them in by hand, I get three one one five nine three. So that that that. Um, I'm sure if I look back at the video I did half an hour ago, I'll see I just did a typo. But that code does work, but it's not the, the, the style of program you should use. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm point eight four four. Yeah, I, I had um, the reason I typed it by hand is I'd um, I'd forgotten how to cut and paste between Internet of Party windows, but I realised it's the the right hand mouse button is my magic with my friends. So thanks. Okay, well that'll be obvious for anyone watching back. I assumed I made an n over two n over two plus one error at the boundaries, which gives you similar errors. Uh, of course, if I run this program on um, four processes, it actually does do the same thing. Ranks uh, one and two and three do nothing. The real one do the same thing as, as before. So it's not a scalable program without going in and editing. And you do you, you want your ideal is to write an MPI program which runs on any number of processes without being having to be um, overly edited. So uh, this is uh, someone's asked, what's the danger of using send over s send? Um, so I'll cover this really in, in the talk after the break. But the, the, the big problem is that because you don't know what send is doing, um, you might it. You might be lucky and it will do, you might have written a program which only works if sends are asynchronous. It's very easy to write a program which deadlocks if sends, sends are synchronous, but doesn't deadlock if they're asynchronous. If you use MPI send on one machine, it may implement them as asynchronous and your program works. So it looks fine, but you're not aware of the fact that your program only works because send is implemented as asynchronous. On another machine on another day, it, MPI may decide to implement MPI send as being synchronous. And then your code may deadlock. So the danger of using send is that you can write incorrect programs that run. You should use MPI send for real programs, and I'll explain why that is in the next lecture. But when you're developing programs, I think you should use MPI S send, which is if, if your program works with MPI S send, it's liable to be correct. If your program works with MPI send, it may have a hidden bug that just hasn't shown up, and it might show up a day, a week or later on a different machine. Um, 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 uh, at a different time or using a different implementation of MPI. But I'll cover this in sort of gory detail in the next lecture. It's not obvious though, it is a, unfortunate I have to talk about this, the, the intricacies of MPI send in the only the fourth lecture of the course, but it is so important and it is probably the most misunderstood thing about MPI, what MPI send does and it does catch people. So I will talk about it in gory detail in the next lecture. So there'll be a break now, and um, I'll come back at half past three with the um, lecture communicators. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, just now is I'm going to go through the stuff about messiora preservation. So um, I'm going to do a sort of try and do a demo here on the desk here. I, this, I normally do this in a different format when I teach live, so this is a bit of a first. Um, you'll probably want to look. Um, switch between the slides and uh, the camera. The way it works in Collaborate, I, I, I see a different view from you as a presenter, but the way it works to Collaborate is you click on, you should probably see a big um, a big screen with the slide on at the moment and a small screen with me. If you click on me, it will switch with the slide and you'll have me as a big screen and you can switch back. So you may want to, to, to alternate between looking at the um, the slides and the screen um, at this point, but hopefully this will work. So, messiora preservation is, is slightly um, subtle, so I'll go through it here. One of the, why I'm going through this actually is, is often people start programming an MPI, then they get worried about message ordering and, and they start to think a bit more deeply. It turns out that MPI just, as, as in a lot of situations, MPI just actually sort of does the right thing and it all works out in the wash. But it is worth going through because if you start thinking about it, it's one of these things that seems simple. You start thinking about it, you realize well, it's a bit more complicated. But it, when you understand it, you realize it, it is quite simple at the end. But it's quite interesting to go through this stuff. So message matching, I'm going to use these are my these folders are supposed to be my receive buffers. And these pieces of paper are supposed to be on my messages. And so the first situation I've got is rank zero does synchronous send of um, so rank zero here is doing a synchronous send of tag equals one, which in this thing is a red message. Okay. Okay. So this is the send, and this is the receive, which is a, a folder. Okay. So what happens is rank zero is doing two sends, and rank one is doing two receives, but they're in order. So rank zero does 
ascend of tag equals one um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to to rank zero, and rank zero does a receive from tag as well. So they match, okay? And then rank zero does another send of tag equals one. Rank one issues another receive. Uh, sorry, apologies. Then I should go back and start again. What, what's going to happen is that rank zero is going to issue a send tag equals one, which is red, and tag equals two, which I've got here is blue, okay? And rank one is going to receive tag equals one, which is red, and a receive of tag equals one, which is blue. So sorry, I'll get back to the start. The first thing that happens is rank one does the send of tag equals one, rank zero does a receive of tag equals one, and they match. And then we move on to the next thing, where, where this uh, rank zero does a send of tag equals two, rank one does a receive of tag equals two, and they match, okay? So that, that's the obvious case. Rank one sends tag one, tag two in order, rank two receive, uh, rank zero says tag one, tag two in order, and rank one receives them in order. So that all works out fine, okay? In that case, buff one is message one, buff two is message two, the send receives it are, are correctly matched, there's no problem. What happens if we do this, okay? Now, rank zero is going to send a tag equals one and then a tag equals two, but rank one is going to receive the tag equals two first, the blue one, and then the red one. So immediately we have a problem. What happens is rank zero does the send of tag equals one, rank one does the receive of tag equals two, they don't match. These two messages don't match. So that's fine, they just sit there, they're not matching. So this guy is waiting for this second message to come along. The problem is because it's synchronous send, rank zero is stuck in its in, in, in the send. Rank zero, because it's a synch synchronous send with tag equals one, say, I am not going to move on to the next line until um, this send is complete. And rank one is saying, I'm not going to move on to the next line. Because remember, receive is always synchronous until this send is received, it, 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 it's re it, until this receive is complete. So there's a deadlock, okay? This is guaranteed the deadlock because, because you have synchronous send, Rank zero is waiting until this completes, and because receive is synchronous, rank one is waiting until they complete. They don't match because the tag is a requirement, and so you get deadlock. So in this case, deadlock due to synchronous send. The send receives are incorrectly matched. So it's very easy to write simple programs in MPI which deadlock. That means at runtime, they just sit there, and it may surprise you, but in MPI, there are no timeouts, so it would sit there forever. What about if we use buffered send? Now, I haven't talked about buffered send. I'll talk about it more in the next thing. But the important point is buffered send is asynchronous, OK? And let's imagine that rank zero is running ahead in this case, OK? So the important point is that rank zero, because it's buffered send, rank zero can send one message. But it's like posting a letter, so it can now send another message. If you use buffered send, asynchronous send, there could be more than one message from you in the network. At once. So what's happened here is rank zero has sent one message and another one. There they are. Rank one has posted this receive. Let's say I want to receive a message, a red message from rank zero. There are two coming in. MPI guarantees their method that they are received in order. So though there may be two messages in the network, MPI remembers they were they, they, the order they were sent in, first in, first out. This one will match. Then we issue another receive, and the second one will match. So although when I issued this first receive, there were two matching messages, both of these match the receive, they're both valid receives from source equals zero with tag equals one, they're red messages, they're matched in order they were sent. Even if in that actu actuality in the network, they might have been at the lowest level overtaking each other, conceptually, MPI maintains the order, so they received this one and then this one. So buff one is message one, buff two is message two. The messages have the same tag, but they're matched in order. The fourth one, this is where people get things slightly wrong, is rank zero is sending a red message and a blue message. So rank zero has sent a red message. Because it's using an asynchronous send, it completes immediately, and it can go on and send another blue message, and then it goes on to something else. So rank zero has sent a red message and a blue message, which are in the network, okay? Rank one has issued received for a blue message, okay? Tag equals two. So the question is, what happens here? 
the messages are coming in. NPI remembers what order they're in. Okay, so they're in this order coming in, but this receive matches this message. What do you think people think happens in this point? Not an obvious question at all. So I'd just like people to maybe have a guess. So there are two messages coming in, the red one first, then the blue one, and rank one is asking to receive the blue one, but there's a red one in front. What do you think happens? How does anyone take a guess? Right, so what Keith is correct. What it actually does is it receives this message. So messages can't overtake each other is, is, is slightly not the, quite the correct statement. They can, so but in this case, this message doesn't block this one, okay? It's like you're reading your emails. You're saying, I want to read an email from my mum, an email I brought from your brother. brother. You just jump and read the email from your mum. So in fact, these, this is, Matt, they're, they're, this, if you can think of these as being in the inbox of the receiver, which is a which is a reasonable analogy, it will match that message. Then it will post a red receipt for time you put one and it will match that one. So in those that case, the messages did some subsets overtake each other, but you wanted them to. Okay. And so the correct statement is not so much that messages don't take overtake each other. It's if if a receive matches more than one message, then the tiebreaker is they will be received in the order they were sent. Okay, that doesn't mean that they can't leap, jump over each other. Uh, that if there's a tiebreaker, if, 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 if the receive matches more than one message, then they will be received in order. So this also happens with wild. So that would say buff one is message one, buff two is message two. Do not have to receive the messages in order. This also happens with wild carding. So by wild carding, I'm going to use a white in box so so the so so rank one is now doing a wild card receive which is saying i'm going to receive anything it's why i don't care what it is so what we have again the interesting situation is where rank zero is run ahead so rank zero sends a red message tag one and a blue message tag two this receive matches both of these messages okay but because it matches more than one message they're received in the order they were sent so those are saying I'll match, I'll receive a message of any tag, then it, but it will receive them this one first, and then it will receive this one. And that's very important because you might, for example, be using the this could be a controller worker situation where you're sending met you where you're sending data out to somebody, you're giving them more and more tasks. How do you tell somebody when it's their last task? And you say, okay, here's some, but this is your last job. Well, you could tag them. You, you could say that the red data means there's more work. Sorry, if you tag your messages as red, there's more work. If you tag them with blue, it's the last one, okay? If they overtook each other, it'd be a disaster because you would get the message saying, this is the last one before you got the last data. So, so message order preservation is actually quite important for correctness. And even in wildcarding, it's important that, they're, that, they're, that, that it works because in that situation, if you're sending data out and saying, look at the tag to decide if this is or isn't the last piece of data you're going to get, you have to use a wildcard on the receive side. Because to be able to receive a message which might have different tags, you have to wildcard it. So the receiver here has to do a wildcard, but if they weren't received in order, then, then the, the, um, the logic wouldn't work. And so in this case, messages are guaranteed to match in the send order. You could then, then you would examine the status to find out the actual tag values. Once you're having received this, you, you don't know what the tag is, but status.mpi tag will tell you always oh, a red message or a blue one. So the real statement is if a receive matches multiple messages in the inbox, I'm using the analogy here, you imagine that the messages are coming in, think of them as emails, they arrive in your inbox, then the messages will be received in the order they were sent. This is only true point to point. This is only true for multiple messages from the same source. There is no ordering in MPI between messages from different sources. The reason is all these processes are running independently. So MPI has no concept of global time. Okay, so if, the, if you did a receive from MPI any source, if just because one source, one, one process send the message before the other one doesn't need to receive it in that order. And to think about it, although I said if I'm on a holiday in Australia and I'm sending postcards to my mother, I can get her to read them in the order they were sent by, by numbering them, okay? That's an agreement, a pair right between me and my mother. My brother is in Canada and he's also sending postcards to my mother. There's no easy way for, for, for my mother to read the messages in the order they were sent unless me and my brother communicate every time. Every time I write to send a message, I say, look, 
The last one I sent was three, you need to number your sport. And that's just too much communication. It just wouldn't work. So if you think about it, it's quite straightforward to implement message order, order preservation between pairwise, between sender and receiver, but globally, you can't do it. And in fact, that's not an issue. The way MPI programs are written, that isn't an issue. But think of the analogy, if you've got, if you and your brother or sister are on holiday, it's very difficult to arrange for your mother to receive your postcards in order, to read them in order, without having extra lots of extra communication. If there's one thing that MPI is, 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 is um, focused on is performance. So, and it turns out that isn't. So people sometimes ask that question. So that's a bit more detail I'd normally go into, but I think it's just give you some food for thought. I don't have any questions on that. Um, but typically, you don't need to tag messages just to make your program correct. Message order preservation normally just works in your favor and messages received in the order they were sent and everything, everything works fine. So, um, I'm going to now go on to the final lecture, which is the lecture on um, which I call communicators, tags, and modes. By far the most important part of this lecture is actually the um, the uh, issues about the modes, which I'll spend most of my time on. Okay, so oops, amazing. Most tags and communicators. So. Every MPI message has a every MPI send routine has a mode. It could be synchronous or asynchronous. Every MPI message has a tag. Every MPI message uh, send takes a communicator. Are these important? Um, you know, how are we going to use them? So I'll cover the MPI modes: B send, which is buffered asynchronous send. I'm uh, sorry, S send, which is synchronous send. Um, by the way, I've got the setup at the moment. My my window is very small, so. After it gets a bit better, I can read the slide now. Um, explanation of modes, S send, B send, and send. The meaning and use of message tags and the rationale for MPI communicators. These are all commonly misunderstood. The modes is essential to understand. Tags and communicators. Tags can be useful. Communicators are often used in more advanced situations. But the fundamental um, um, focus of this lecture is to explain how modes work. So these are the modes. NPI S send, synchronous send, is guaranteed to be synchronous. It's like making a phone call. The routine will not return until the message has been delivered. So it's clear what it does, but you can see immediately there's the problem, that there's the, um, there's the uh, potential for deadlock. If you phone somebody and they're not ready for the message, they have not issued a receive, you'll wait forever. NPI B send is buffered send. It's guaranteed to be asynchronous. You might ask yourself, well, why does MPI call it buffered send? Well, the reason is that what you're saying to MPI is here's some data. I want you to send it off to somebody and just, just send it off and come back to me straight away and I'll, I'll carry on. It's like sending an email. I don't care if and when it gets there. Just let me get on with my work. The problem is you say, here's some data. Please send it. The routine returns to you. And the next thing you're going to want to do is to alter that data. But if you, how can you alter the data when you don't know the message has been delivered or not? In fact, you're not even going to get a notification of when the message is delivered. So the only way you can safely implement asynchronous send is for the system, MPI, to take a copy of your message. So if you think about it, the only way to implement an asynchronous send, the analogy of sending a letter or an email, is for the system to take a copy of your message. And that's why MPI calls it B send, buffered send. It's trying to make it explicit that this message is going to be buffered, copied by MPI. So when you call MPI B send, MPI takes a copy of it, delivers it later. That means when the routine returns, that you're free to do whatever you want to do with the original data. You don't need to make the copy yourself. MPI will do it. MPI send, which is the standard send, can be implemented as synchronous or asynchronous. And this causes a lot of confusion. But let's we'll come back. So a timeline here, time is going uh, from top to bottom, time is going down the way. Process A is running away, running some, uh, and process A wants to send some data to process B. I'm using kind of a reduced syntax here. So process A, I get a bit of, does S send X B. I want to send my data X to process B. At this point, Process B is running some other non-MPI code. I said, because an MPI communication is explicit, if it's running non-MPI code, it's just running on its own. 
So at this point, because it's synchronous send, what happens is that A waits in the S send. A is picking up the phone and waiting. So you're somewhere in the API library just sitting there waiting on the phone. As I said, it may surprise you, but there are no timeouts in MPI, so it will sit there forever. If you've written a correct code sometime in the future, process B will if you're received. And so at this point, the reason it's called synchronous send is there's a synchronization in time. The data transfer happens at this point. The, the data from X is transferred over the network or whatever to the variable Y on process B. And there is a synchronization in time. That's why it's called synchronous send. It's like making a phone call at some point when you're speaking to somebody, sender and receiver are on the phone at the same time. At that point, the S send returns and the receive returns roughly at the same time. And the important point is the S send return means that X can be overwritten by A. That's really important. So Basically, you've asked for the, for the variable X to be sent to the process B. When the S send returns, you know that X can be, you can overwrite X. It's been, and you know you can overwrite it because it's been delivered. You can carry on and you can reuse that variable or that array. So that's what, the, the, when, when send returns, when a send return returns, you can always overwrite the variable. That's why in answer to the previous question, I, I said you don't need to make explicit copies. When the receive returns, Y can now be read by B, okay? So you've transferred the variable X on process A, the variable B, uh, the variable Y on process B. Let's think about buffer and send, which is asynchronous, okay? We start off the same, process A issues a B send, process B is running some other non-MPI code. But what happens now is because this is an asynchronous send, a buffer and send, process A doesn't wait for process B to issue the receive. So what happens is the system takes a copy of X and then it returns and X process A can now overwrite X, not because it's been delivered, but because it's taken a copy. But the, but the, the outcome is the same. Whenever a send routine completes, be it synchronous or asynchronous, you can overwrite the data because either it's been delivered or it's been copied, but either way it's safe to overwrite the data. So process A can just carry on doing what it wants. Hopefully in a correct program, process B will later on issue a receive. But there is no synchronization here between the send and the receive. This happens sometime in the future. And at that point, the data is transferred from X to Y. And presumably MPI frees up this routine, uh, frees up this storage, the receive returns and uh, y can now be read by B. So we, we've achieved the same, um, the same outcome. We've transferred data X on process A to Y on process B. But this looks nicer. This looks nicer because there's been none of this waiting around. A, there wasn't any dead time. Process A didn't have to wait for process B to pick up the phone. And B, um, there's no, much less danger of deadlock. If I issue a send to B and B doesn't issue the receive, I'm not going to wait forever. I can just carry on. Message may never be delivered, but at least I don't, I don't wait forever. So you might say, well, why aren't all sends done asynchronously? The problem is that the system has to take a copy. So the system has to allocate memory to take a copy. So what happens if it's a two gigabyte message or a 10 gigabyte message, okay? You might be a bit cheesed off if you launched the MPI program and you ran out of memory, and you looked up the manual, and it said, oh, MPI reserves 10 gigabytes of memory for buffered sends, um, for asynchronous sends. You say, well, I, I don't want it to do that, okay? Um, so the, the problem here is that buffered send is a requirement. When you issue a buffered send, you are mandating, you are saying, I mandate that MPI should take a copy of this message, that it should buffer the message. And that's quite difficult to do in practice, because it's not clear how much, um, how much um, uh, data, how much storage MPI should, um, should reserve for that. So M MPI is slightly cited, so this is just a note. So receive is always synchronous. So the, the, the way I, um, I drew this diagram is that I had process A running ahead of process B and issuing the send first. If process B had been ahead of process A and the receive had been posted early, then there wouldn't have been a, such an issue. This diagram would have looked very like the synchronous thing because the receiver would have been pre-posted. So just the interesting situation for this example is if process B is slow, 
process is running ahead. Okay, let's just, just um, to point that out. Um, the process be issued to receive before the B7 process ended, B would wait and receive until the B7 was issued. So it would look the same. The receive is always synchronous, so in process B would wait. Okay. So where does the buffer space come from? So MPI's rationale is it's up to you, the user, to reserve buffer space. So if you're going to do asynchronous sends, okay, you have to do this, you have to do this calculation. You have to say, okay, I'm going to use asynchronous sends in this program. I'm going to need 40 megabytes of space to buffer those asynchronous sends. So what you do is there's a horrible buffer. There's a routine called MPI buffer attached. But if you're a program, you have, you have to allocate 40 megabytes of memory, leave it empty, and say to MPI, when you buffer your sends, when you do asynchronous sends, stick them here, OK? So the system tries to store the message in the free space in the buffer. If there's not enough space, then B send will fail. So if you issue a B send, an MPI doesn't have enough memory. If the memory you have given it has run out, it will fail. It will say, I cannot do that. I cannot buffer this message. And that makes you think, well, isn't it obvious to work out how much memory you need? Well, it's not, because after the B send returns, okay, the very next thing that process A could do is it could issue another B send, another B send, another B send. Process A can, in principle, issue an average number of B sends before process B ever issues the receive. Now, in many programs, you can, you can constrain this. You can say, well, the logic of my program means there can never be more than four, six, 10 outstanding B sends. So I know that if my messages are a megabyte long, there can never be more than six outstanding B sends. I never need more than six megabytes of buffer space. Well, actually you do, because MPI needs to store the header information. So there's a magic variable which tells you how much header information you need, and then you double it just to be safe. But it's all a bit ugly. And so the rationale MPI says is, don't tell MPI whether to use synchronous send or buffered send. Let MPI decide. And that's where MPI send comes in. MPI send says, I want you to send this message, and I want you to choose whether it's synchronous or asynchronous um, uh, based on, on what you think is best. So the, the, the problems are, SN runs the risk of deadlock, B send is much less likely to dead, deadlock. Your code may therefore run faster because you don't have all this waiting around. When you phone someone, you have to wait for them to pick up. When you send a letter, you don't have to wait for the you don't have to wait for them to read the letter. But the user must supply the buffering space, and the routine will fail if this buffering is exhausted. So MPI send tries to solve these problems. There's a default amount of buffer space provided by the system. This is separate from the explicit space. So this is this is a separate space. The system said, I will reserve. A megabyte for 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 for, um, for 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 standard send. Send will normally be asynchronous. So normally MPI send is asynchronous. Normally MPI takes a copy of the message and just moves on. However, if the buffer is full, if the message is too large, MPI doesn't fail. It says, "Well, I don't have enough buffer space, so I'll just go synchronous. I'll just wait till the person picks up. Everything will be fine." So the MPI send routine is unlikely to fail. But it could cause your problem to deadlock if the buffering runs out. So, that, so the rationale. Ah, yes. So uh, I should have said this. MPI. So you do see. So it's one of these cultural things that Fortran programmers never use functions. MPI programmers rarely use MPI B send. But if you are going to use MPI B send, what you don't do is MPI buffer attach, MPI B send, MPI buffer detach. What you do is you attach a buffer exactly as John has said here. He's, the question is, is MPI buffer attached something you do only do once at the start of the program? Yes. You just kick up MPI, you attach 40, 100 megabytes, whatever you think are much, and then you say to MPI, for the rest of the 10 hours of runtime, use that buffer space. And if you're feeling um, virtuous at the end, you'll do MPI buffer detach at the end to detach it. But yes, it's something you do right at the start. You, you can attach, detach, attach, but that's not the way it's meant to work meant to attach it at the start and just let MPI get on with it. So yes, correct. MPI buffer attach is something you do when you do once at the start of the program. However, I would recommend not to use MPI, um, MPI B send. You should use MPI send. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll, I'll say, well, actually, you still run the risk of deadlock if MPI send is implemented synchronously. But the way to, to avoid that is something called non-blocking communication, which we'll cover next week. The issue comes here. People often write codes like this. <coughs> process A 
oops, uh, my cursor is in the wrong window. Process A does a send of the variable x to B, and process B does a send of the variable y to A. In uh, many MPI programs, you might be doing, um, might have a domain decomposition, you have to exchange boundary data, halo data, and you want to send data from there to there, data from there to there. So you say A sends to B, B sends to A, okay? This code is not guaranteed to work, okay? So if you think, imagine these were synchronous sends, okay? Imagine, if these were synchronous sends, this would be guaranteed to deadlock. Because A is trying to synchronously send it to B and say, I will not return, I will not progress until that message has been received, which requires B to issue a receive. B is going to issue a receive, but before it does that, it's synchronously sending data to A. And so they're both on the phone at the same time, wondering why it's engaged, and just stay there forever. So process A, it wants process B to issue the receive, but process B can't issue the receive, it's waiting for process A to issue the receive. So if these were synchronous sends, this is guaranteed to deadlock. Because it's standard send, it might deadlock. Every third Wednesday afternoon, MPI could choose that send is going to be invented synchronously. So this is technically an incorrect program. This, this is guaranteed to deadlock. So the reason I say you should program with S send is it means you write correct programs. When developing programs, you develop with S send, you write correct programs. When you run them in practice, you should probably convert your S sends to sends, which will mean they'll go faster because sometimes it might use buffering. But the problem is people, this is the worst situation. This is an incorrect program which might run correctly. In practice, what MPI does is it will have, most implementations will have some minimum message size. They will say messages below 4K, 8K bytes will be buffered. Messages above that will be sent synchronously. But you don't know where that threshold is. So you might write your program on your laptop where that threshold is 20K. So you're writing, you're sending messages which are 10K long, they're buffered, and you've written an incorrect program like this. But you're lucky because these, these, these messages are sent asynchronously, they're buffered, and it happens to run. Then you go to a large system like Archer, where the threshold could be smaller on Archer, I think it's rather right by default like 8K and then suddenly your program stops working. Okay? If you developed that program with synchronous send, you would have found it didn't work on your laptop, and you would have been more likely to develop a correct program. So th this is a bug akin to assuming that in C or Fortran, variables are initialized to zero. Int i, integer i, you assume that i is initialized to zero. It might be, but it's not guaranteed. You do a send, and you standard send to send a variable to send a message. You assume it's implemented asynchronously, you assume it's buffered, that is not necessarily true, and this can cause problems. So to avoid, so how do you avoid deadlock here? Well, in a simple case like this, you could just pair them up. You could say process A could do send and receive, process B could do receive send. Okay. So if you're doing this pairwise swapping, then you can just pair them up. Somebody does send receive, somebody does receive send. However, that's not a general solution. So it doesn't generalize to, to more than two. So in general, you solve the deadlock issue using non-blocking communications, which is the next lecture I'll do next week. But for this course, you should program with S send. It's more likely to pick up bugs such as deadlock than send. If you write an incorrect program, you want it to fail. You don't want it to just run and then it will be a, to be a hidden bug, which will bite you later on. So as I said, it's unfortunate this is only the fourth lecture and we're going into sort of details, but it is a very fundamental issue. And I'm trying to explain here, MPI says that MPI send can be synchronous or can be asynchronous. It can be S send or equivalent of B send, but you don't know which. The rationale is MPI will just do what it thinks is the right thing, what it thinks is the most efficient thing. But the implication on you is that you don't know if it's, you should assume the worst case. So when you do standard send, you always assume would my program be correct if it were implemented synchronously? Because actually, is my MPI might um, choose to implement sends, standard send synchronously. If you look at this diagram here where I did an explicit synchronous send, this data transfer happens when both A and B are on the line. They're both talking to each other. In that case, this could be done with no intermediate copying. It's possible for the data to go straight from X on process A to Y on process B with no intermediate uh, buffering whatsoever. And so for very large messages, you would actually want this. You want large messages to be sent synchronously because it's, it's very slow to, to copy things. It's also, you may not have enough buffer space. So 
So that's why MPI has this threshold. Large messages are sent synchronously with standard send. Small messages are sent asynchronously. But there's no guarantee you don't know where that threshold is. So I'll just pause briefly there because um, are there any questions about that? So synchronous is like making a phone call, asynchronous is like sending a letter or making uh, or an email, and standard send can be either an MPI. In principle, could choose randomly, toss of a coin whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. In practice, it does it based on a threshold. And that threshold is implementation dependent. Uh, and typically, the more processes you run on, the lower that threshold is. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, an obvious thing to do would be say, okay, the MPI library will, for each process, reserve enough space to buffer one message to any outgoing destination. So if you run 1,000 processes, you have to have 1,000 slots. If you run 10,000 processes, you have to have 10,000 slots. So you're needing more storage on the more processes you run on. So typically, this threshold between which MPI switches from asynchronous to synchronous decreases the larger your process count. And this is the classic thing that people have. They find their program runs correctly on their laptop, doesn't run deadlocks on Archer. Because on Archer, they're running on 10, 100,000 processes for the first time. This threshold has to be very low because MPI can't reserve a lot of message for buffering. And so, and so standard set is more likely to be synchronous. And then it will show up any deadlock issues in your in your original code. So um, if there's no questions, um, a couple of sort of side issues. Um, you can check to see if messages have arrived. Okay. Currently sends current. So um, No, well, the only so so if you're doing explicit B sends, then the only limit is the um, I lost my cursor. Uh, the question was, uh, I'm just reading the questions out because it's it's sometimes difficult for Claire to capture them on the um, on the recording. Is there a limit to how many concurrent B sends can occur? So, if you um, if you're doing explicit B sends, so you're mandating that they're buffered, you can do as many as long as it fits into the buffer which you have attached with MPI buffer attach. Okay? So if you have to explicit B sends, you can chain up as many as fit into the buffer, okay, which you have you have given MPI explicitly. If you're doing MPI um, standard send and MPI chooses to implement them asynchronously. You can get into problems. If you send lots and lots of messages, it can sometimes panic. Um, so the classic area you get on Archer is uh, too many unexpected messages. What that means is you've issued lots and lots and lots. It normally, it normally points to a buggy program where one process is doing lots of sends, standard sends, which MPI is trying to buffer, but the receiver is slow or hasn't issued any receives, and at some point it runs out. So, so there is a limit um, for explicit B sends. You can work out what it is, how many outstanding sends can be in the buffer, which I have given to MPI. It's a slightly technical question, but I believe the right answer is if you're doing MPI sends and MPI chooses to do them asynchronously, it will try and, and store up as many as it can, but at some point it's just going to fall over and say, look, I'm the post box is full. I can't take any more messages. Does that answer your question? In principle, MPI could switch then to be to doing synchronous sends, but in practice, it can sometimes be different because the messages might be being buffered at the remote end. So how do you know what's happening at the remote end? It gets a bit, you'd have to speak to an MPI developer to get the chapter and verse on that. Um, this is kind of a random place for this slide, but MPI allows you to check if any messages arrived. You can probe for matching messages. So MPI probe is a routine which says, so, so, so some, some people sometimes say, OK, um, how can I receive a message of arbitrary size? If I send a message to somebody and you don't know how, how big it is, how can I make sure that the receiver can allocate enough message for an arbitrary size income and enough storage for an arbitrary sized incoming message. You could always send two messages. You could send the first one would be a single integer saying how big the message is, the second one could be the message. So you could receive the first message, 
say, oh, the next mesh is going to be a thousand integers long, malloc that space, allocate that space. But that's very inefficient. You don't want to send lots of messages. So NPI allows you to do a probe. So NPI probe is exactly like NPI receive, except the message is not actually received. So NPI probe says, what message would I have received if I put a received here? So NPI probe fills in the tag, so it fills in the status. So what you can do is you can do an NPI. If you don't know how big the incoming message is, you can probe, you get the status, you then can act, you can do a query of NPI get count on the status. Say the incoming message is going to be 100 integers long, allocate that space and receive it. Um, status is set as if the receive took place. So you can find that cipher message in that case prior to receive. Be careful with wildcards. You can use a wildcard in probe, you can do NPI any source. But then when you issue the actual receive, you have to specify a specific source. Because if you do NPI any source again, you're not guaranteed to get the same message that it matched when you did the probe. So if you're going to do a probe with NPI any source, um, sorry, I've got my cursor from the wrong place again. Um, you have to do, it's a bit of a technicality, but you have to do NPI probe, NPI any source. Then when you do the actual receive, you have to specify a particular source of your status for NPI source. It's a bit of a, that's a bit of a corner case. Um, in practice, in scientific and technical programming, we tend to have fairly rigid um, prescribed communications patterns. So NPI probe is not something that you would normally do in, um, in a scientific and technical probe. You, sometimes you do, but generally it's not. So I, I get nervous that people are writing programs that use lots of probes. Sometimes you have to use them, but it's not an idiom. That you know, that's why I don't mention it very early on, but people often ask. Tags, every message can have a tag. It's a non negative integer value. Um, where's the message received? So, um, NPI probe. So, the question was um, can you probe if there is no message to receive? NPI probe will, this, so that is a blocking operation. Um, it will wait until there is a matching message. So if you do NPI probe and there's no matching message coming in, it will wait forever. Uh, so well, you can probe if there's a message received, but NPI probe waits until there is a message. So it actually will wait till the message comes in and return and say, this is the message which has just come in, this is its detail, then you can receive it. So, um, so you can probe if there's no message to receive, the danger is it might, yes. It's synchronous like receive, again, there are non-blocking versions, which, which I can, I'll mention in the next lecture. But MPI probe, MPI probe is identical to a receive, except it doesn't actually receive the data. That's the way to think about it. Um, tags, so the major uh, purpose of this lecture is to explain modes. Um, Buffered, standard, and synchronous. Uh, every message can have a tag. It's a non-negative integer value. Um, they can't be arbitrarily large. Um, so um, MPI guarantees that the, a valid MPI implementation should, should support tags up to 32767. It would be very, very so. Any decent MPI implementation will will, will support tags up to. The maximum number of some people like to tag their messages with the, the rank of the sender. So any MPI, any modern MPI implementation will, will will support much larger tags than that. But they can't be arbitrarily large. And some people run into this problem. An archer tags can't be more than a few million. And so, for example, if you've got a particle simulation, you're doing molecular dynamic simulation with billions of particles, you might want to tag the messages with the the ID of the particle. That can sometimes get people into, into problems because their particles can number in the billions, or at least hundreds of millions, uh, but tags can't be that large. It's just a slight, that's, that's a really an arch specific issue. When people port from their laptop to Archer, they sometimes run into foul of the fact that they have assumed that tags can effectively be arbitrarily large, as big as two billion, but they, they can't be. Um, tags can be useful in some situations. They're only really useful with wildcarding. Because remember, if you tag with one, you have to receive with tag one to for it to match. So you haven't transferred any useful information. 
So you can't use, I mean, a lot of programs never use tags. So, so if you're not going to use tags, you have to specify them, just specify tag equals zero and move on. They have, the tags have to be non-negative, but um, other than that. Communicators, all MPI communities take place within the community, all MPI communications take place within the communicator. Fundamentally, communication is a group of processes. An MPI com world is a predefined communicator that contains all of the processes. It's not the only predefined communicator. There's actually one communicator called MPI com self, which contains only one process yourself. Um, a message can only be received within the same communicator from which it was sent. Now, this sounds like double counting. The sender specifies a tag and a communicator. The receiver specifies a tag and a communicator. The tags must match. The communicators must match. That's like double double counting. It's not because you can't wildcard on com. So you the, you know you have to specify the same communicator at source, at sender and receiver for it to work. Um, and so um, they can't. And that gives you a, a measure of security. And there's a number of uses of communicators. The one which you might think is up well is that in software, you can effectively split your, your computer into different parts. So imagine that we had a, a, an application where we run it on seven processes, MPI com world um, is of size seven, ranks naught to seven, and uh, naught to six. And I want, to commit, I want to run one calculation on four of the processes and totally other calculation on three of the processes. How do I keep these separate from each other? How do I make sure that messages in this communicator can never be received in this group of processes. Well, I split them to different communicators. I have a, a communicator which I'm called COM1, which can, contains ranks not one, two, and three, and COM2, which contains ranks four, five, and six from the parent. And these are different communicators. The routine to, to do this is called MPI COM split. I don't cover it here, but you can look it up in the manual. MPI COM split allows you to take a parent communicator and split it into an arbitrary number of subcommunicators by each one specifying some some some, some different um, it's sort of a coloring analogy. Um, now, if you think about it, within a communicator, your rank is guaranteed to be between naught and and one less than the size of the communicator. So, if you think about it, your rank is specific to a communicator. Here, it ha happens that the ranks in COM1 are, are, are the, um, the same as the ranks in COM1. But here, ranks 4, 5, and 6 have become COM2, which is size 3. Within, rank, within COM2, these ranks have separate IDs, because within COM2, their ranks are not 1 and 2. Because, so your rank is a local concept. Your rank is a rank within a communicator. By far, the most important rank is your rank within COM world, because that's guaranteed to be globally unique. But if you're going to start playing around with communicators, you have to remember that your, your rank is, is local to a communicator. You have to remember ranks local to the communicator. So um, this guarantees messages from the different pieces do not interact. You might have said, well, I'll just tag my messages in this, this get, these guys will tag their messages with tag one. These guys will tag their messages with tag two. Will never have any problem, but the problem is you could issue a receive with 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 um, uh, tag equals MPI any tag. So receive here could issue a, a match to send over here. If you split them to different communicators, then it's a guaranteed division because communicators can't be wild carded. The other thing you want to do is the, the one of the major reasons for communicators to allow you to write parallel libraries safely. So for imagine. I've written a sort routine, or I've used a Fourier transform here, but a sort routine is, a, is an equivalent um, uh, example. I've written a parallel routine that allows you to sort distributed data into order. Clearly, that routine is going to send messages. It's going to have to communicate with each other. How do I make sure the messages that the library sends are inadvertently received by the user? The user could have posted a receive from tag equals MPI any tag, source equals MPI any source, which could match any message from anyone to anywhere. The worry is that messages in the library will be, will be received by, by some stray receive in the user code, and then the library will just break down, because you'll send a message within the library and it'll be received by a user receive and nothing will work. What a library will do is, what the first thing it will do is it will produce a copy of COM world. It will produce a new communicator, but that contains all the same processes, but it's logically a distinct communications world. You can do this with a routine with MPI com, dupe, com duplicate. 
So if you're going to write live routines, it's a bit more, more advanced, but if you want to write live routines, you're guaranteed to be safe and always work. The first thing you do when the library is called is for everyone to say, look, we're going to be in the secret communicator called MPI Secret Com, which will contain all the processes in Com world, but logically a different communicator. So they're separate communications worlds, and it guarantees that messages in the in the uh, library sent in Com library, which you keep secret, can't be intercepted by the user processes who are using Com world. As I said, you can't do this by saying it's okay. In the library, I use tag 999. That won't work because the user could have a stray received with MPI any tag at the time. So that's why communicators are there, and they're, they're fundamentally there to allow you to write um, to write code safely, either to, to portion off processes into separate worlds, separate from other portions, or to allow you to send messages which which can guarantee to be um, isolated from, from the user. So summary, why bother all these modes? Well, it's a little complicated, but make sure you understand S send and B send. S send maps directly onto synchronous, B send maps directly onto asynchronous. Send can be either asynchronous or synchronous. MPI is trying to be helpful here, giving the benefits of B send if there's sufficient memory, but not failing completely with the buffer space runtime. This does cause a lot of confusion. So it's the most commonly misunderstood apart, um, portion of MPI. What does MPI send do? A lot of people think it's guaranteed to be asynchronous. It is not. It's likely to be asynchronous, i.e. buffered internally for small messages. For large messages, it will be synchronous. And it's quite easy to write a program to find out what, where that threshold is. The amount of buffer space variable, you should never assume that send is asynchronous. This is the system buffer space. This is separate from MPI buffer attach, which, it, which gives buffer space for explicit B sends. These are sort of implicit B sends, MPI standard send. MPI had its own buffer there. You may have control over that. There may be some magic environment variable. MPI B send, MPI standard send internal buffer space size or something. That, but that's all, you know, some people say, oh, well, my program assumes send is asynchronous, but it works if I make this magic environment variable big enough. No, no, you should fix your program. You should write code which is guaranteed to work anyway. Two, what are tags for? Some people don't use them. If you don't want to use them, just set them all to zero. Some people like to tag messages with the rank of the sender, but to be honest, most of the time when I see people using tags, they're being overcautious. It's because they haven't understood message order preservation. In most situations in MPI, you don't need tags because message order preservation saves you. Messages are received in the order they were sent. There are some situations where tags would be useful, but in programs with a well-defined communication structure, you very rarely need them. Question, can I just use MPI Com World? Yes, many people never need to create new communication in their MPI programs, but I think it's bad practice to specify MPI Com World explicitly in your routine. So if you're writing a C program here, you've got MPI, you've got MPI Com rank. It's nice to write, write MPI Com rank, Com rank, MPI Com size, Com size. MPI Com World is a horrible, big, ugly, constant. Um, it's nice to say MPI com, com equals MPI com world. This is identical to having com world specified explicitly verbatim in these lines here, but it has two advantages. One, your code looks a bit neater. But B, if you come back in a year and you say, well, actually, I want this code now to run on any communicator, not MPI com world, you already have that generality here. This com can be anything, and the code will work in its generality. If you hard code MPI com world everywhere, it's going to be quite a lot of editing pain to generalize this code. So it's a bit more elegant to, to, to um, assign com world to it. This is not the same as MPI com dupe. This is not making a new communicator. This code is identical functionally to having MPI com world specified explicitly, but it just looks a bit neater. So the question here, which is, on the subject of tags, does your answer apply to blocking and non-blocking comps? I find that unless you use tags for non-blocking, otherwise they can interfere with each other. So yes, so um, um, I I often see people. We'll talk about non-blocking communications um, uh, next week. But the important part of non-blocking communications is they have the same side effect as asynchronous communications. It means you can send. Lots of there can be lots and lots of messages outstanding at any one time. Um, in, so at the receive side, you're saying, Well, this guy's sending me lots of messages, I get lots of messages from lots of different people. How do I make sure I receive the right one? 
one way to do that is to tag them. However, Messy order preservation applies for non blocking operations as well. So, normally, if you write your code, um, set non blocking, send non blocking, send non blocking, receive non blocking, receive, they will match in order. So, I can't talk about your specific situation, but often you can get round how to, yeah, using tags can make it more safe, but often they're not necessary if you order your, um, if you order your sends and receives correctly. So that, that, that is a point where, so I have seen some programs where they need tags to function correctly because of their use of non-blocking communications. However, you could normally have rewritten that and been a bit more careful about the ordering that you didn't need them. So it's really a matter of choice. Um, does that answer your question? I might mention this more tomorrow when I talk, and next, not tomorrow, next week when I talk about non-block communication. How can I make a copy to? Well, no, he does, it's okay, it doesn't, my code isn't great. No, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, it basically, you know, you should always program defensively. And so if you, you know, if you're unsure about how mess your order preservation works, and it's not simple, then using tags is the right thing to do. You have a robust and um, um, a code which is guaranteed to work. However, if you understand mesh order preservation, you can often get around that. It's really a matter of choice. So Soros uh, said, how can I make a commentary in some processes? So the, the routine is called MPI com. I don't cover it here, but it, it's just man MPI com split. So I'll, I'll bring up the man page. So if I'll switch to this. Um, So I should be sharing the, uh, I've done the wrong thing. No, anyway, there it is. So I'm sharing the, uh, so on, on Cirrus, on most, this should be a man, man MPI com. MPI com split. So MPI com split is a collective routine, but everyone has to call it. So you all collectively get together and say, we're going to, we're going to, that everyone calls MPI com split, but specify um, the com is the is the parent communicator. So normally you would say com world. So the com is, the com you specify is the parent communicator, and the new com here is what you get back. You get back a new communicator, but they will be divided into subgroups based on the whoops the color and the key. The, the main thing is the color. This is a number one two three. So if some of the if some of the some of the processes specify color one, spe some specify color two, and some specify color three or color in this American spelling, um, all those processes that specify the same color end up in the in a subcommunicator together. So if 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 you want if 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 let's do an odd even, yeah. If the odd processes specify color equals one and the even processes specify color equals zero. All the odd processes will be grouped together into a new communicator, and all the even will be grouped together in a new communicator. So it's a completely general routine. Key is just a tiebreaker. Tiebreaker says, so your question might be, well, ranks one, five, and well, let's say ranks one, three, five, and seven, the odd guys have now been put together into a, an odd communicator altogether. How are they ordered? Who becomes rank zero, one, two, three? Um, if you specify a key, you can specify the ordering. So they're ordered in, in order of increasing key. So the normal thing to do is specify the key as your, as your rank, which means that your, at least the order in the subcommunicator will be the same as the order in the parent communicator. Your rank in the subcommunicator will not be the same as the rank in the parent communicator because your rank is local to, to a communicator. If you go to a small communicator, you can have a small rank. But the ordering you can get. So, 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 so the color is the, all the red guys end up in communicator one, the blue guys end up in communicator two, and the key is like a, a, a tiebreaker. Does that answer your question? So MPI con split is your, is the most general routine. There are more useful, sorry, there are higher level communicator split routines which do, um, which, which, 
which are maybe more user friendly, but this is this is the lowest level one. No, ah, okay, so so yes and no. So it's a very good, this is a very good. So maybe I should I'm going to share a whiteboard here. No one I would scribble on the share a blank whiteboard. So Can people see that whiteboard? People seeing, yeah. So let's see if I can get the wrong one. So I can get rid of There we go, fine. So what I'm, so MPI com split only allows you to split into subgroups, okay? So it's a, uh, I'm gonna get it wrong with bijective, injective, or surjective, I can, but it's, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? So, Using API com split, you can only create this chunk. However, um, this isn't every time you specify a send, you specify a communicator. So it's not a hierarchical thing. You're not saying I am now becoming. This isn't a tree-based thing. You you might think well, at any one point in a, my program, my, my my process is it belongs to to a particular communicator. No, your process can belong to many, many communicators. And it can decide randomly to send a COM1, COM2, COM1. So you could then do another, so let's basically, let's, let's kill this. Can I do a color? Let's do it in red. So you could do a one COM split and split them into three. You could later on do another COM split a bad choice of color to green. Yeah, that's also a bad choice of color to blue. I'm split into two. So this process here, uh, let's get, now let's see, this process here is remember this red communicator, but also remember this blue communicator, which overlaps with these guys here. So, so, so yes, I can, I, I can simultaneously be a member of that communicator and that one where that one overlaps with that one. So MPI column split, a single call can't produce overlapped communicators, but by having multiple calls, you can create as many communicators as you want. And you are a member of as many communicators you want at the same time, which may or may not overlap. It's a bit of a subtle, does that answer your question? So, so, so you could imagine a programming model where you said, and there are other programming models, I don't know if people are aware of something called Coray Fortran. It's a, it's a PGAS. It's a, it's a, it's modern Fortran now has parallelism built in through something called Coarrays. And in, 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 in Coarrays, you say, I will now become a member of a, of a, a, they're called teams and there is a hierarchy. So you can't, you can't have overlaps because you, you are actually within a communication point. But MPI says, no, 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 you can create communicators and you specify. So every send, there's no implicit current communicator. That could have been a model, but it's not. The communicator is explicit in every MPI call. So that's a very good question. Um, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So I've not used this drawing packet before, but I don't know what else you can do. Yeah. Shapes. Mm. Presumably you can do smileys and things like a pointer. Oh, I stopped sharing. Okay, that was okay, that was interesting to get that. Uh, so uh, so so the question is this is how you do halos in domain no so so what in domain decomposition um, what you'd normally do is you would um, you just need to work out who your neighbors are. So you would, this is a bit of, so, so, so imagine you have 16 processes and you want to be in a four by four grid. Um, depending on how your axes work, if you're process five, you've got some logical number, your neighbors will be products, so that's a bad, bad, bad example. If your process six, your neighbors will be processes. Um, drop, let's drop that thing. I'm now going to try it out. Uh, share, sorry. Now. 
So what you would do is if in your mind, your process is arranged like this, but they're numbered naught, one, two, three, use a terrible writing, four, six, seven. If your process five, you just have to know your neighbors here are nine, four, six, and one, and you could just send to nine, four, six, one in MPI com world. I think maybe asking if you would create a sub communicator which contained all these guys. Is that what you, that you would you would you would do that? If that was your was that your? I've seen people try and do that, but but um, normally what you do is you would just consider yourself you're all in com world and you would just say look I'm five so my neighbours are nine one four and six, and I will send to them. Does that answer your question? So if I'm process five. I need to know my neighbors are nine, four, six, and one. And then within MPI com world, I can just send to nine, four, six, one. I guess you're saying, you know, would I, could I create a communicator which basically encompassed these guys here? That's not really the model that MPI uses. The, the problem that actually MPI to read the standard says, you can use some communicators, but we'd expect a normal program would have a few tens of them, not thousands and so no that this doesn't illustrate a point though that actually I, i'm not going to have a chance to cover it in this course but mpi does allow you to create so in mpi com in a normal communicator the only identifier you have is your rank i just think of it as a bag of processes but in a real code you might think well actually i want my process to be arranged in this 2d grid you can you can create communicators which have a structure they're called Cartesian communicators. So in MPI, you can say, okay, I've got 16 processors. You can tell MPI, look, these are actually arranged in a four by four grid. And then you can say to MPI, I like to send a message up, down, left, and right. That doesn't make sense in com world. In com world, there's just an integer, not 15. There's no such thing as up, down, left, right, forward, backward. But MPI does provide support for domain decomposition because you can say they're called Cartesian communicators. I've had to skip it in this curtailed course. You say, please arrange these 16 processes into a 2D grid. And then in some sense, you can say to MPI, who is my neighbor up that? Once you've done that, MPI says, okay, four by four grid, I understand that. Then you can ask MPI who's up, down, left, right, because you now have a communicator which has a structure. So communicators can have structure. They're called Cartesian, they're called topologies. Cartesian is the, is, the, is the regular grid. So there is support in MPI for that, but, um, but, but, but still in the, the, the natural thing to do would be to do this, um, just work out the rank and send up, down, left, right. If you start creating sub communicators, you will probably overkill and it will probably blow MPI. MPI will say, you've just created a thousand communicators. So any loss from having many, many communicators. Uh, so, Yes, and so MPI, if you read the MPI standard, it says, I expect that, commu well, communicator creation is quite, can be, if you read the MPI standard, it says, I don't expect users to create that many communicators, so communicator creation doesn't have to be that efficient. So if you're creating more than a few tens of communicators, I'd start to worry that, um, once they're created, there's no overhead, I don't think. Um, Give me a second. Well, there might be, if you have thousands and thousands of communicators, every time you send and receive a message, MPI is going to have to say, oh, which communicator is in it? There's a thousand of them, and it might not be very efficient at that. Might do like, so I, I would say if you've got a, more than a few, when you've got more than a handful of communicators, like, you know, if you, then, then that's not what they're meant to be. That's not what that's not what they're meant to be used for. They're meant to be used for quite high level things. So um, I would worry if you have lots and lots of communicators. I have seen. So uh, that's maybe not a clear answer, but but um, that's not the model. They're meant to be there to be used for a particular set of circumstances. Um, they're not supposed to be. Uh, used willy-nilly. Don't know if that makes sense. 
It's a good question. Um, uh, well, the standard thing you do in domain decomposition is you um, you uh, you create one you create one Cartesian communicator. You just create one extra communicator, and you're all in that. Yeah, I, you, you might. Yeah, you could understand. Yeah, another. Yeah. You, the problem is if you did that, then this communicator here only applies to, yeah, but for rank six would have to create a, a communicator which contained these guys to do its communications. Actually, that wouldn't work. Oh, so rank, so, so you'd have to have a communicator for the up, the down, yeah, it, it just gets, it's kind of nasty. It's not, it's, you're right, that, that's, a, so I have seen people do that but it's not really MPI's model. Um, and in fact, you think about it, there's overlap because six has to be a member of this guy as well. And there will be one communicator for every process. Yeah, there would be. And that's not something which MPI. So the process from one to other. So that's a subtle, so. Um, so you can't. I mean, a communicator is a logical thing. It's a group of processes. The processes don't physically move. So, you know, it's like, you know, work. It's kind of hard to describe. But, you know, the processes don't physically move. A communicator is a logical construct. So, you know, you could be process three. You're a member of com world. You're a member of com odd. You're not, you're not a member of com even. But you never move physically. You're still sitting, you know, on your own, running as a completely independent process from all the other guys. A communicator just defines the people with whom you can communicate. But there's no, there isn't really a way you can't transfer from one com to another. That doesn't really make. I, I can't describe it. It's, it's not. It's not the model. Uh, no, you, you can't physically, you can't physically move them. No, you can't. So your process, as I said, a, communicators are logical concepts on top of the processes are always sitting there. Just think of each process physically running on a separate CPU core. Actually, think of each process physically being on a different machine is actually the, my best analogy. Um, and so, uh, no, they don't, they, they're, that's not the So I understand. So I, I, so yeah, I do understand. So I understand there is a, um, in some sense, I think of processes being fixed, running on a CPU core, never moving. They can be in different groups at different times, but those groups are, you know, I could be in a lunch group, which is me and three people at work. I could be in a, a staff group, which is everybody. I could be in a group of people who play squash, but I just sit. I never move. I just sit in my office. Um, but yeah, you remember your question. Then I maybe not answer the question that you're asking. So next week, I will put the slides up in a day or so. That I'll start with an MPI quiz. That might might not take this long, but uh, MPI quiz is just a set a, a simple set of questions. I I set this quiz up. You just need a browser to attend this quiz. It's not a big deal. Um, you can, the questions you answer anonymously. So best thing is just have a guess. Um, this quiz was set up because it asked questions which were the things which people seem to most misunderstand at MPI. I tend to sort of teach to that now, but so people tend to do, well, um, you may have heard the answers, but I will do that quiz. I think it's a useful way of promoting discussion. Then I will go through the Pi solution, which is already that there in some detail. It is quite a simple example, but it illustrates a surprising range of MPI concepts. So I will basically spend the time before the break doing the quiz and going through the solution. After the break, I'll do the non blocking communication and the practical is meant to the ring, which requires non blocking communication. And then on the final week, I'll go through the ring solution again and talk a bit about collectives and cover the practical and have a general Q&A at the end. I will put these, these slides up in the next day or so. I'll also put up corrected versions of the slides where I have the source destination. Um, I said the exercise just to, is for each process to compute its subcomponent of pi. 
which you do by messing around with the stop limits on the on, on the loop, but then to nominate a controller and rank zero is as good a controller as anyone. And for all of these guys to synchronously send a message to the controller to rank zero and rank zero to receive all those messages. And rank zero can add them up and we should get the right out value of pi to within to within machine precision anyway. Oh well, sorry, to within the limits of the expansion. You should get the same answer as the serial code limits of machine precision. 